public, uh, a lot of folks here from the public, it looks like. So we'll be mindful of that. Great, Chair Hogan, we're ready to roll. All right, uh, good evening all and a happy new year to you. My name is Brendan Hogan, calling to order the January 2021 meeting of the Public Works Commission at 6.33 p.m. Welcome all. Um, first item on the agenda is the agenda itself. Does anyone have any comments or concerns about the agenda? We're ready to entertain a motion otherwise. I'm ready to make a motion to accept the agenda. All right, thank you for that. Second. All right, is there any discussion around that motion? Okay, to a vote, please. All those in favor of approving the agenda as posted, please say aye. 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 So, uh, any opposed? All right, agenda passes. Next to public forum. I see a couple hands in uh, virtual hands in the air. Thanks, Chair Hogan. Uh, just to let members of the public know, if you do wish to speak when Chair Hogan calls for public comment now or later on in the forum, please use the raise your hand feature on Zoom, which you can find on the lower um, lower toolbar on the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those who have called in, and it looks like there's at least one or two of you. If you wish to speak during public comment, please push star nine and that will alert us that you wish to speak and you'll be queued up. Um, for those watching on YouTube, uh, thank you to channel 17 for live streaming this. We do not monitor those comments in real time. So we'd ask that you join us over on Zoom or by calling in which you can find on our agenda to join us in public comment. All right, uh, Mr. Golding, could you, uh... But you're tracking the, the hands in the air? Yes. Yep. Just pulling that back up. Sure. All right. The first uh, person in line for public comment is Jeff Nick. You'll be promoted to speak any minute now. He's still muted though. Jeff, you should have the ability to unmute yourself at this time. I've uh, hit that button if you're having any, looks like you're good to go. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, great. All right, well, thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'm the chair of the Marketplace Commission and I guess it's a little unusual I would come to to speak during public forum, um, but the commission has and our, and our fee payers and customers have some great concerns about the changes that were made to, um, to um, South Winooski Avenue. And staff did pass a visit earlier this summer to kind of explain what was going on. So we, we certainly had fair warning. Um, but um, we've received a lot of feedback and, and all of us on the commission are concerned moving forward what this might do to the, the traffic um, that we all rely on to make the marketplace successful. Um, as you know, it's a heavily trafficked uh, road corridor and we understand the goals and, and they are noble in terms of bike and pedestrian access. Um, you know, but we just feel that uh, there's some really problematic um, components to the design. And, you know, now they're not showing up with COVID and the parking garage is lightly used and uh, traffic is way off on the marketplace, but we hope and suspect that things will rebound this summer and into the fall. So um, a couple of the things that we really are concerned about are the offset intersections um, with Bank Street and the uh, and the City Market and Cherry Street, I think it's Buell Street, and all of the UPS trucks and beer trucks and tractor trailer trucks and delivery trucks and garbage trucks. And you throw it all out in the mix and then you throw in students and <clears throat> high, high trafficked weekends. And 
even before these changes, you know, two years ago, you could see problems with traffic backing up, trying to get onto uh, Bank Street to access the garage. So we see it every day and we are concerned and we're hoping that our concerns are not realized and that this all works smoothly. But we just want to kind of put it on your radar screen that we're not convinced and that we hope that if these problems do pop up that, uh, you know, we can work together to maybe make some changes back uh, the other way um, or, you know, figure out another way to, to do things. But uh, just want to put that on everybody's radar screen. Thanks for your time and um, happy to talk about this again sometime if you like to. All right. Jamie, Thank everybody. you. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. The next person in queue is uh, Johan Larson. I'll be promoting you over to speak. And you should be able to speak now. Uh, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Joanne Larson, and I reside at uh, 50 Charlotte Street. And I'm uh, coming to you to raise a safety concern and to request information and guidance of you. Um, I brought my safety concern to Philip Peterson, an engineer at uh, DPW, and he suggested I speak this evening. On January 4th, recycling was not picked up on Charlotte Street. And we were told that the recycling truck could not get through because cars were parked on both sides of the street. And uh, having a critical care nursing background and aging as I am and uh, ending my career in quality, my immediate thought was, well, if the recycling truck can't get through, what about an emergency medical services vehicle, such as an ambulance or a fire truck? Um, and I became concerned for my personal safety as well as my neighbors. I vo voiced my concern asking in Front Porch Forum if, if others were concerned as well and got many uh, responses from both Charlotte Street and the surrounding neighborhood streets of Five Sisters. Um, I tried to reach the fire marshal via email and voicemail to obtain more information to see if they had concerns about their vehicles, but I have yet to receive a response from them. Um, so I have uh, three questions. One is, does the city of Burlington have safety concerns for emergency vehicles uh, access to narrow streets such as Charlotte Street? Uh, two, I'm told that there are 160 narrow streets in Burlington, 98 of which have various forms of parking restrictions, and that Charlotte Street meets criteria for some form of parking restriction. In light of that, I ask you what options you might offer to us as residents that would improve the reliable access of emergency vehicles to ourselves and to our homes in the event there was a safety issue. And three, um, Mr. Peterson initiated a C-click fix related to my concern. My question around that is what is the process and timeline for such a C-click fix request to be processed? Um, I'm seeking your advice. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for that input. Director Spencer, do you give off a response? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say usually we don't do a back and forth, uh, Ms. Larson, but uh, I'm happy to follow up with you. Philip uh, is the proper point person. This commission would receive a recommendation from staff once we've done our due diligence and bring a recommendation that they can either uh, agree with, deny, change, or uh, do what they would like. So uh, we will follow up with you after this meeting and happy to continue the conversation. We uh, share your concern about emergency access. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
The uh, third and currently final speaker signed up for public comment is under the name family outcomes at yahoo.com. You should be able to speak uh, at this time. Hi, my name is Trina Beck. Can you hear me? Yes, can. Great. Um, I live on 77 Charlotte Street and I've lived there for 15 years. And each year that we have a snowstorm, um, a large truck, like a fire truck, um, or recycling, or the snowplow cannot get through uh, our street when two cars are parked on each side of the street. And that happens all the time. And all it takes is two cars parked right opposite each other. and um, the um, big trucks can't get through. So this is a serious safety issue. Um, and I understand that Charlotte is a designated narrow street. So that seasonal parking um, on one side of the street is an option. And uh, that way the plow could get through uh, and uh, other large vehicles. Um, so I hope you can help us figure out um, what the best option is. Um, and uh, we look forward to being able to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Chair Hogan, there is one more speaker signed up at this time. Asa Levi, I will be promoting you over. Hi, I think I'm off mute now. Um, I just want to say that I watched your meeting from uh, December 16th, and I really appreciated the thorough discussion on the um, Shelburne roundabout um, renovations to that intersection down there, which is quite a complicated project. Um, I just moved into 573 South Willard Street over the su summer, and I th think the renovations look or the proposed design looks great. I'm a little concerned about the speed of traffic on South Will on South Willard Street, particularly as it's a downhill entering the intersection, um, which currently has a stop sign. Currently, three of the inlets to that intersection have stop signs going into it, and those will be, I think, removed when it turns to a roundabout. Um, so people already whip by the over, like when they're doing the bypass from South Shelburne Street onto Willard going north, they really whip up that street. And I really liked, um, I, he's not here today, but, um, and I don't know his last name, I'm sorry, but Norm's suggestion to do geometric improvements to avoid, change the geometry to avoid. And I know there's a merge going in there, but I was thinking if there's any way possible to slow traffic down through geometry of intersection, like either through speed humps on South Willard Street um, or something else, that would be really nice going into that intersection as well. And I emailed, and thank you for your detailed reply, Commissioner Overby, about this as well. Um, but I just wanted to bring it up here on the meeting. So thank you all for um, listening to my comment and for all the work you're doing on this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Chair Hogan, it looks like that's all that is currently signed up. Okay, thank you, Mr. Golding. With that, I will move forward to the consent agenda. There are three items on the consent agenda this evening, um, largely informational items regarding a 2021 paving program, BHS parking configuration, and uh, review of the narrow streets policy. Chair Hogan, just real quick on that. Uh, you know, we have narrow streets policy as part of our consent agenda. I'm not proposing to make any changes, right? I think it, it highlights well what the speakers were just speaking to about Charlotte Street. And I can't, I, I don't know for sure if Charlotte Street is on that list. From the sounds of it, I'm suspecting yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this policy is um, uh, really glad we have that. And I'm thank, thankful for. Uh, um, Bill Peterson's input and his guidance and the documentation here. So it's, it's interesting to see that connection tonight. That's my only comment, thank you. All right, any other comments or discussion? I, 
So since I'm on a roll here, uh, I'll move Please. to approve the consent agenda. We have a motion, Mr. Archambault. Second. We got that with the Commissioner Bose, the second. All right, noted. Any discussion around the motion? All right. To a vote, please uh, approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the consent agenda passes. Thank you. Next up, item five water resources, rate restructuring, and affordability program updates. Get a uh, staff communication on this. Yes, indeed. We have Division Director Megan Moyer and. Uh, oh. I got my tardigrade, sorry. Water Resources uh, <laughs> Programs Manager, uh, Jenna Olson joining us and also our Water Resources uh, Finance Manager, uh, Jessica Lavalette. Hi uh, folks, thanks for your time. Um, I don't know if you wanna, Jenna or Jess, were one of you planning on sharing the- I will, yep. More presentation. So taking you back almost a year, uh, it was actually the week in which the pandemic hit, hit Vermont. Um, we were on a path of doing the public outreach, the full blown public outreach on our sort of final draft proposal for our rate restructuring um, and affordability program. With the pandemic um, and with a host of the financial pressures and uncertainties, we did put that project on hold and we are back here better than ever uh, tonight, uh, Jenna and Jess are going to be reminding you where we were, why we, why we were there, um, and then rolling out our current iteration of rate and policy changes. Um, we've made some incremental changes since we last spoke to you that kind of uh, speak to some of the additional concerns um, that our customers are now facing. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to these uh, highly intelligent, amazing team members uh, to regale you with all of the wonderfulness. Thanks, Meg. Um, good evening, commissioners. Thanks for your time. Um, as Megan said, or Chapin said, my name is Donna Olson. Um, many of you have met me before, but I am the Water Policy and Programs Manager. Um, and again, I am joined this evening by Jessica Lavalette, who is our Customer Care and Finance Manager in Water Resources. So um, jumping right in here, because we do have limited time, obviously, the, this whole thing started or this whole process started really because there is um, some tension that exists between you know, the core values that we, that we work on and that's a constant balancing act. Um, having sustainable funding is really crucial to ensuring that everyone has access to clean water because we need money in order to take care of the infrastructure that produces, you know, both produces the clean water and makes it safe for drinking, and then also treats and manages our wastewater and stormwater before it drains to our rivers and the lake, which is our drinking water source. Um, the conflict there really arises is that um, the more financing we need in order to provide that access to clean water uh, and inevitably raises utility costs. And when those utility costs aren't affordable, then uh, that bleeds directly into our rate payers and um, can result in rate payers not having equal access to the essential amount of water that they need to live. So when we started this process, the first thing that we really asked ourselves was, you know, how much does it really cost to provide water service in Burlington? Who's using the water and our uh, are all of those users paying their fair share of the costs associated with providing their water? Now our distribution system has to be sized appropriately to provide adequate flow to all of our customers, but each customer class is unique and doesn't place the same level of demand on our water system. So the graphic that you're seeing here shows three rings. Um, the base level demand that infrastructure um, is really just for normal residential and commercial water usage. And that's what's represented again by that smallest inner circle. Now our pipes would be a certain size and all the fixed costs for chemicals and electricity and pumps, you know, all of those things that are necessary to provide that clean, safe drinking water would also um, be finite. 
But what happens when we add things like watering our gar gardens and lawns or um, that peak demand when everyone's using water at the same time, say bath time for your kids or when you're doing dishes, people are taking showers. We can see that our distribution system has to be that little bit larger in order to provide water for both that base level demand and those extra capacity flows. So that's the second circle that you see. Now that final circle, the largest one that says fire protection, that's how large our system has to be in order to provide flow for all of the private fire services in the city if necessary. Now every building has a domestic water service line, but almost all commercial buildings, institutions, and large multi-unit residential buildings, um, anyone who has some type of fire protection system also requires that separate larger service pipe to provide that fire protection. Now, as we mentioned before, as the size of our pipes increase, so do the fixed costs that are needed to treat and deliver the water. So going back to one of our original questions, are all customers paying uh, their fair share of the cost to provide their property with water? Today, the answer is no, because everyone in the city is paying the same rate, even though certain customer classes inherently require our distribution network to be larger and they, they're the only ones that benefit from it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jess and she's gonna talk a bit about um, our rate and policy changes. And then towards the end, I'll go over, um, you know, what our next steps are and how things are gonna look from here. Thank you, Jenna. So again, my name is Jessica Lavalette and I'm here to discuss the proposed rate and fee changes along with some estimated customer impacts and what opportunities exist for our residents to further reduce their bills. We have six proposed rate and policy changes that are all considered standard best practice within the water utility industry. Additionally, these changes do support our goals of ensuring affordability of water while improving the financial health, sustainability and revenue stability of the funds. These changes are also meant to ensure our customer classes are paying for services in a manner equitable to the burden they place on the system. I'm gonna notice some items in green here. They are adjustments we've made to our proposal since last March in an effort to mitigate the impact on commercial customers while still maintaining affordability benefits for our residential customers. So the first one we see here are fixed charges by meter size. We are proposing a fixed fee for both water and wastewater that escalates based on meter size beginning with five eighths inch meters up to our largest size of six inch. This is important because our current rate structure is entirely volumetric, which means our expected revenue is based on how much water we think properties will use in a given year. And unfortunately a cold rainy summer or global pandemic can't be predicted during the budget process. So incorporating a fixed charge for all meter sizes will ensure a nugget of revenue um, that we can count on to provide stability for the funds. This type of rate structure is also viewed favorably when we need to borrow money and allows us to qualify for lower interest rates in some cases. One of the modifications here in green from last spring is a reduction in the amount of the fixed fee charge. We were able to achieve a lower charge by modifying the calculation basis along with a target percentage of our cost recovery. The next one here is the lifeline rate tier. Currently, we do have a uniform rate structure where everyone is charged the same amount per 100 cubic foot which is equivalent to 748 gallons. The introduction of a lifeline rate allows us to define the water needed for essential life activities as 400 cubic feet and charge less for usage under that threshold, which we are calling tier one. Any water consumed above that tier one threshold would be charged a higher tier two rate. Class base rates, as we learned just a second ago, the strain each customer class puts on our water infrastructure is inherently different. So it doesn't make sense to continue charging all customers the same rate. This change does allow us to recognize that difference while providing support to our residential ratepayers. Here we see a modification from the original proposal whereby commercial properties will now be charged the same rate as multifamily properties in an effort to recognize the negative impact the pandemic has likely had on their businesses. We move here to the irrigation rate. We are proposing a higher rate for water used solely for irrigation or cooling towers but have allowed an exemption for community-based gardening initiatives like BACG or the Intervale. Private fire protection charges. So this change introduces a monthly fee for customers with a private fire service or hydrant, which is standard across the country. This fee will escalate according to the diameter of the fire service pipe and conceptually goes back to our cost of service analysis where we are paying more to have a water system capable of serving should those properties need to use it. 
Um, please note this fee will now be phased in over five years, which is a change from the original proposal where we assess the full fee in year one and the Water Resources Assistance Program, or RAP. This is the change that I'm personally most excited about and believe has the potential to make a real difference in the lives of our customers. We are proposing to waive the fixed meter charge for residents of single family properties who can demonstrate they are at or below 185% of the poverty, federal poverty level, level. Excuse me. There is a whole slide later on dedicated to the details, but I did wanna mention it here. Um, and we modified this proposal to now include any senior citizens living in single family homes, along with nonprofit housing developments providing affordable or senior living units. Next slide, please. So here are the current and proposed rates. Um, we can see now that the fixed charges are assessed on all meter sizes. Uh, we have always assessed a fixed charge on meter size at one inch or larger, but this will be the first time since 1996 that five eighths and three quarter inch meters will receive one. So you can see here the five eighths goes from zero to $3.34 per month. And on the wastewater side, that's $4.68. If we move down to the volumetric rates, we can see that the single family residential volumetric was previously charged a uniform rate of $4.44, but we now have the proposed two, two tier rate structure. Um, the tier one or lifeline rate for usage is for usage under 400 cubic feet, and that will be $2.49 per hundred. The tier two rate will be applied on consumption over 400 cubic feet and will be 623 per hundred. The threshold of 400 cubic feet was chosen because it's the median usage in Burlington. And in 2019, 54% of our residential customers fell into this usage category. We preferred to use the median um, instead of an average because the median is unaffected by outlier data points. This rate would also apply to separately metered duplexes and triplexes. So if each side of a duplex had a water meter, then they would qualify for the tiered system. But if there was only one meter for both units, then they would fall under that multi-family residential rate you see there, which is a midway point between the two tiered rates. And so to recap, all single family usage between zero and 400 falls into tier one and any usage above 400 falls into that tier two rate. Um, the rate for fam multifamily residential mixed use and commercial is currently $4.44. And we're proposing that it remain the same for all, but at a slightly lower rate of 436 per hundred. Um, this does provide some relief because they are typically larger consumers and would actually pay more if they were eligible for the life lifeline rate tiers. Our previous recommendation did have mixed use and commercial classes at a higher volumetric rate to reflect the cost of providing service, but we decided for this upcoming fiscal year to leave them at that lower rate to mitigate the presumed negative impact the pandemic was having on those customers. The irrigation rate here is slightly higher than the uniform rate, but it will be increasing substantially to 748 per hundred. This does reflect the cost of providing service and sends a pricing signal to conserve water when use is not for basic needs. The wastewater volumetric rate is currently 620 for all users, and we're proposing to reduce that to 608. This is not, there is not a cost of service rationale to charge for wastewater based on customer class. And now if we move to the far right column, we can see that private fire charges are proposed for the first time and escalate based on size. These rates reflect 20% of the intended full charge as they are being phased in over five years. Um, not shown on this slide, there are two other charges on the water resources bill. One is for stormwater. Um, that has been assessed since 2009 and is based on property type with single family homes, duplexes and triplexes um, being charged a flat fee and all other properties being directly assessed. Um, the stormwater rates are proposed to increase by 5% across the board next fiscal year. And the water bill also contains a franchise fee charge, which we are required to pay to the general fund based on city charter. It's currently set at three and a half percent of water and wastewater sales. Next slide, please. So here we have a snapshot of the possible customer impacts. As part of the rate study, we did create a model that utilized consumption data from calendar year 2019 to calculate the estimated financial impact for each account. As noted, the bills will vary based on water consumption, meter size, available fire, um, private fire protection, and whether the customer is eligible for WRAP. Our typical customer is indicated by that median volume row, and they will see virtually no change in their water bill. This is because they are able to take advantage of that tier one lifeline rate and those savings offset the new fixed meter charge. If that same customer were to be eligible for our customer assistance program, then their estimated bill now drops by about 15.7% a year. Our low volume customers will see an increase due to the fixed meter charge being assessed for the first time, 
although being eligible for wrap here also significantly reduces their estimated bill. As we go down the list, we see varying impacts based on customer class with most increases being related to private fire protection charges and the stormwater rate increase. It's important to note that a large increase doesn't always correlate to a significant monetary increase. In that first example, we can see a 15% increase is actually only $52 a year or just over $4 a month. I also wanted to share how the pandemic and related emergency orders significantly altered consumption trends. This calendar year, we, we have seen an average increase in residential consumption of about 10% and a decrease in the commercial usage of about 30% when compared to the previous year. So we have developed um, an account impact summer request form for customers to fill out if they are interested in receiving a projection of how much they will be impacted by the proposed rate changes. This will include data from our model along with information about their post-COVID consumption trends. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we've discussed how the impacts of our proposed changes will vary by customer class and habits, but overall we expect the bills to be higher for those customers who have vacant homes or those with unused irrigation meters. This is because of the fixed fee and it's certainly an opportunity for them to consider removing the meter permanently. Properties with um, protective fire infrastructure should also expect to see an increase. And this would be a chance to validate their internal records against ours to ensure there are no sizing discrepancies. We expect bills to be lower for those customers with that typical use of 400 cubic feet or those who qualify for wrap, again, because of that lifeline rate and fixed fee waiver. And of course, any efforts to reduce usage above that tier two threshold would further shrink their overall bills. Uh, next slide. Okay, wrap. So this program is the very first ratepayer assistance program or initiative for water resources. The goal is for us to limit the administrative burden and costs associated with developing an income verification program. So we're intending to leverage existing state and federal benefit programs as our qualifying, qualifying criteria. This means that customers who already participate in programs like Lifeline or Three Squares Vermont, Crisis Fuel, uh, Rental Assistance through Section 8 can apply and just simply use their proof of enrollment in that program to be qualified for RAP for one year. Or in the case of senior citizens, um, providing proof of their age would meet that eligibility threshold. I'd also like to point out that we are open to adding other qualifying programs and encourage feedback about other initiatives that we should consider. One of the more difficult challenges we face with implementing an assistance program is how to provide relief to renters who don't receive a water bill. Ultimately, there's no way to guarantee that a landlord would pass any savings along and we are certainly not alone as most water utilities struggle with how to reach tenants in a meaningful way. We may not have an answer to this problem today, but we're certainly not giving up and hope to address it with future initiatives. Um, we've also begun developing some additional assistance programs that address infrastructure and conservation needs. These proposals include offering grant funding for condition assessments of sewer laterals, making no or low interest loans available for proactive replacement of water services or sewer laterals. Um, and efficiency rebates for installing appliances that conserve water, availability of real-time water data to monitor and lower usage, and providing free tools to implement stormwater management practices like rain barrels. These will not be ready to roll out in July, but we're actively working towards them. And now back to Jen Olson. Great, thanks Jess. Um, so our next steps here, uh, obviously we're in the January to March frame uh, time frame. So we'll, we've been attending the NPAs. Um, we're attending the NPAs between January and February, um, depending on space and their agendas um, with election stuff coming up. It's um, been a little tight. So we did get pushed to some of the February NPAs. Um, we are here talking to you. We will be um, presenting to the TUC on January 26th. And then um, doing our targeted notification to cost those customers with fire services, hydrants, irrigation meters, you know, those, those higher impacted folks. Um, meeting with, you know, our key community partners and the other large users. We'll be hosting an open house public meeting for all rate payers virtually on Zoom, um, hopefully in early to mid-March. Um, we also have a really robust online presence where customers can review all of the presentations we've done to date. Um, provide feedback via web forms, and as Jess was saying, um, make that request to get an estimated account impact summary. Um, our continuous improvement will be happening between M March and July. That's where we're going to be incorporating the feedback that we receive, um, reviewing, validating, and responding to all of those impact summary requests, and doing our ongoing uh, QA, QC with the data and making any required updates that we need to make to our billing system. 
Um, this will also be when we're drafting our um, wrap policy and making whatever necessary ordinance changes we have. Um, we'll be seeking approvals from uh, the commission and the mayor's office between April and June. So, you know, the city council will have to approve the rate and fee structure, structure changes, including that water rate affordability um, program. And then um, city council and mayoral approval of our budgets and rates and our uh, ultimately our budget for fiscal year 22. And then um, we're hoping to roll out uh, through July and August. So July 1 is when the changes would go into effect meaning that um, the, the changes would be reflected in people's August bills. So um, Jess, Megan and I are here to answer any questions that you have at this point. Um, you know, you can also feel free to reach out to the three of us at any, at any point over the coming weeks um, directly, but um, we do have some time that looks like maybe 10 minutes left to answer questions. Great, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. So we'll go bring it back to the commission for discussion at this point. Um, Vice Chair O'Neill, would you like to start? Sure, sure. Thanks. Um, so first of all, I, I appreciate your, your fee adjustments, recognizing that COVID has just kind of put everyone in a tailspin. So thank you for that. Um, and also, I like this idea of the um, account impact, estimated account impact summary. Um, certainly like probably almost everybody else here, I saw our water bill go up once everyone in my house was home drinking five cups of tea a day and peeing five cups of tea out of their bodies. <laughs> so uh, I was like, holy cow, stop taking showers. And my kids are like, we're drinking too much tea. So I think that that's, um, that will be really useful. I, I might even take advantage of it myself. Um, and how do you think that's going to roll out? I mean, like, um, is it going to be kind of labor intensive for you folks to do this impact summary? Are you guesstimating that a certain percentage of uh, your customers will be taking advantage of that? You know, kind of trying to anticipate your labor going into that. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure how many people will opt to do the form. We've already received one. Um, the model itself already exists, so the existing calendar year 19 data is there. I just pull it. It'll just be going into the billing system now to get the post-COVID consumption, because as you noted, it, it's very different for some accounts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I mean, I'm hopeful that people take advantage of it so there are no surprises and have the opportunity to talk to them and engage um, about, you know, the, what we're doing and, you know, their consumption or just different things going on in their house. Um, we have a lot of great materials, um, leak de detection guides and other things that could help people. They may not have called before or contacted us. And that form, um, Jenna created the web form is already out online. Um, so we just get the email um, and we can send it to people via mail if they can't do it online as well. I'm hoping it's not as labor intensive as creating that web form because that, that tested me. <laughs> Sometimes when you front load things, then things get easier. So I, I hope, I hope though. Um, a question about um, irrigation. When you speak of irrigation, this is, um, you know, kind of a, a pet peeve of mine, and, and I hope this addresses it. Is this residential um, automatic sprinkler systems, um, or is it irrigation for kind of the intervale or wherever else? Yeah, so I mean, the irrigation accounts we have um, about 244 right now, with most of them about 210 being residential. So that would you know, speak to your automatic sprinkler sort of folks. There's some commercial ones for lawn and then there are other accounts that we consider irrigation or water only and they're for cooling towers or um, cooling equipment and things like that. Um, you know, Except for the BACG and the Intervale, um, we're not intending to provide that lower rate for um, the other water only accounts that are for irrigation. I was just gonna chime in. It depends yeah. on whether you have a separate um, meter. So some people sure. have automatic sprinklers that are just tied in off of the oh, and they haven't gone through the mean. process to get okay. a separate meter. So um, it would just be for people who have water metered separately because when you do that, you do get a little bit of a break because you're not paying wastewater for it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, um, thank you. And then I guess one final thing. Um, your The conservation assistance, um, is that um, 
like similar to the kind of beat the peak that BED has as far maybe, um, you know, because I love that idea of, okay, we're raising rates. Um, this is what we need to do to invest in our infrastructure, but also this is what you can do um, as consumers to, you know, tighten up faucets and rain guards and so forth. Is there, is there a time in the year, like when we have in the summer to beat, beat the peak? Is, is, do you guys have a system like that or cycles like that? I, Jess will have to speak to whether we have specific cycles. I mean, I'm sure that consumption is higher in the summertime with gardens and stuff like that. Um, and just, you know, people are generally using more water outside, but we, the, the conservation program that we're talking about would be fairly similar. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we have, we already have a lot of literature for folks. We have a, um, you know, a conservation and leak detection guide that folks can go through step by step with all of the fixtures and different appliances in their home to um, do leak detection. The last couple of events we've hosted, we've actually been handing out kits. Um, we are going to purchase more of those and they're kits specifically to either test for leaks or um, put, you know, conserving fixture or conserving items on your fixtures. Like um, there are certain things for faucets, certain things for showers, toilets, things like that. So okay. the, the conservation program would be very similar. I think the other thing um, that we would be looking at is um, providing assistance with smart meters for folks. So especially in cases where um, individuals are just really struggling to figure out where they're using all of that water and when it's happening, um, you know, we would be looking to help folks out with, with implementing or um, installing those smart meters so that they could, you know, monitor their water usage in real time. Just to clarify a little bit, building out smart metering network is something that we're looking at and requires an actual network. There is the possibility of being able to supplement people with individual sort of third party devices. So that's one thing that I think Jenna is alluding to. But just so folks know, um, for a multitude of reasons, we are looking at sort of what our timeline is for being able to have what they call an AMI network, where as your meter, as we modernize your meter, it would then be able to talk to these fixed networks and, and send that data in a real time basis, because we feel like that does give people the power to be able to alter their usage or to see oh, I'm almost fully in that first tier, right? If I just save a little bit more water, I could get my bill entirely in that first tier versus going over into the second tier. That that would be great. That and like having like cold water turn on when your teenager's in there for more than whatever time. <laughs> just saying, then, you guys. <laughs> as, as our customer service people say, we're only responsible for the water, not the hotness. So we can't. Um... <laughs> that is true. Um, I did want to say that we do actually have radio boxes in our meter asset fleet right now. About 10% um, of our radio boxes can data log. So right now, if a customer has one of those boxes, we can, at their request, um, just drive up to the property, wake it up, and it gives us 96 days of hourly or daily information. Um, and I we just did that for a customer today. Um, so if they have one of those, they can really see. And it's, it's really great. I mean, you can see at two o'clock in the morning, this is when it happened and it went for two weeks. Um, the dashboard, as Megan said, that sort of thing for people to access on their own will be a little bit later, but for some customers, we have that now. Great, thank you. Thank you all. I mean, I just love geeking out with the water stuff. So thanks. We love it when you geek out with us. <laughs> send you a, I'll send you a water bear tardigree. Yeah. Tiki, I'll get, I'll get the whole commission, some of those reusable bags too. <laughs> yeah. Well, those things are great. <laughs> got tablets, we'll have a whole kit. Commissioner <laughs> Archibald, anything uh, you had? Oh, uh, what a coincidence. Uh, I, I did want to let Megan know that she has a giant water bear sneaking up on her, so in case you weren't aware, <laughs> we don't want to see you get hurt. Um, questions, uh, tell me a little bit about the private fire protection. I'm just unfamiliar with that. So there are certain properties in Burlington, mostly commercial multi-unit. They have um, a separate fire service. So off the main, they would have um, a, their domestic water line and a fire service line. Or there are some properties that have private hydrants as well. So in their parcel itself, embedded larger properties have those as well. And um, yeah, there's a cost, you know, for us to be able to serve that if they need it. I mean, their system has to be X amount bigger um, in the event that they do need that. Um, and so we are proposing to charge for that. 
sure. right now. Um, there was, I don't know, it was, there was an initiative in 1991 to do the same thing. Um, and that's the data I'm working off in terms of sizing and sort of doing all that quality checking to see who still has a fire service, who killed their fire service, um, who has a new one, that sort of thing right now. Um, and I don't know if Megan has anything to add to that. Yeah. yeah. I think oh, what's sorry, really, Megan. I was gonna say, I think what's really interesting, we are only proposing at this time to charge for the uh, additional costs that the utility bears as a result of private fire services. There is actually an additional cost for even all of the public fire service that we provide, um, which at this point we're not you know, seeking to charge that to the city, but it is a, I can't remember, um, and Dave Fox, our consultants on the line, but it's a pretty substantial number what that fixed cost is to have the big pumps, the big pipes, to be ready to serve in the event of a fire. And it all ties into people's uh, uh, insurance ratings. So our being able to say that we have sufficient fire flow then enables people to access a lower insurance rate. Yeah, it's fascinating. I had not known of that before, but I guess, is this reserved to larger institutions, say the hospital or, or the college, or would it, it would also be, be other developments? It would be anybody who has a fire service. Um, so anybody I think he's who, asking who has fire services. Okay. Most of your commercial larger buildings, um, so not your resident. I mean, there's some residential, multifamily residential, um, but I would say it's yeah. primarily it's mostly your commercial buildings. and larger buildings. Yeah. It's the sprinkler system specifically, right? That's, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and then on the private fire hydrant, there are places where in their private property, they have their own individual fire hydrants um, and UVM and UVM Medical Center or private developments where the streets haven't been accepted, those have private fire hydrants. Yeah. Okay. But so actually, Jenna, you made a good point. So that's sprinkler systems as well then, that, that would fit that definition. Well, yeah. if they have a wet system, it's they have a fire service. They could have a dry system, in which case um, they likely don't have an actual fire service line, which they wouldn't be charged. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and I mean, I know this commission has heard appeals before about when you go to a third floor, you either have egress or a sprinkler, sprinkler system, for example. And so that those who opt towards the system may may see this being um, in time. So it, if, if it's a wet system and they qualify, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. Uh, my other question would be, uh, you had mentioned the, the income sensitivity, which I'm, I'm really glad for the work you put into this. Clear you you did a lot of homework to put this together and it really reflects the values of our community right and trying to make this thing sensitive and paying um you know for the use that, that comes along with it so how would a lower income resident qualify for a lower rate as you all had described earlier yeah so if someone already is enrolled in an existing benefit program pretty much, you know, most of the ones from the state. So if they get section eight, if they get lifeline, if they, um, three squares, any of those crisis fuel, um, we worked, we, you know, we met with CVOEO to sort of see what the programs are. They just have to show us, um, anyone who's a, is approved for one of those programs gets an enrollment letter and it has, you know, that they're approved and it has a specified period of time. They're just gonna need to remit that, a copy of that letter to us. And we're gonna accept that letter as enrollment in our program for the same amount of time. Okay. And we had talked about this a bit with Councillor Pine too, and we will be, you know, coordinating with CEDO to make sure that there aren't any pro other programs that we're missing, um, you know, and, and making sure that all of those programs get incorporated since CEDO, CEDO has a lot of expertise in that area. Sure. Well, and, and Councillor Pine had suggested that, you know, the federal poverty limit is not the best metric of right. income sensitivity and that we should perhaps be looking at the, the HUD HUD, HUD HUD median income. Yeah. So um, I think the other point is, and Jess and Jenna and I have talked about this, if somebody comes to us and says they're having a hard time paying their bill um, and, and they qualify for some program that we don't have on our list, then of course we're going to adapt our program for yeah. you know reasonable reasons. Yeah. yeah I think oh, I'm sorry, Jenna, please. No, I was just gonna say, we, we are working with our legal team to, to make the policy flexible in that way. Yeah, that's great. And that's kind of what I was, driving at to see if there was that flexibility. Uh, so we're, I'm sure the department's gonna learn things as it's gets rolled out and programs and that kind of thing. So that's great that you're already anticipating something like that to get ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's it for me. It's like, I don't have enough good things to say. This is excellent work, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Barr. Thanks, I 
just figured out you're going alphabetical. Um, so uh, great presentation, thank you. And I, I think this is uh, really due. Uh, this is something that I think will really help. I will say that as, um, and maybe those that might be watching this can, can learn from maybe my mistake. Um, my hot water heater went and I had to put in another uh, system and I was talked into doing an on-demand system and now it takes almost two minutes to get hot water. So I feel like I'm using more water. So I'm gonna reach yeah. out to somebody to figure out how not to do that because cold showers on a 14 degree day is not something I'm excited about. So Good for our immune system. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty immune then. <laughs> I also feel like that's counterintuitive. I feel like an on-demand system should be heating up faster, so. They said something about the, the size of the pipes because I live in a 200 plus year old house. Okay. And I have to rip everything out to put all new piping in. That'll do it. So I'm gonna ask somebody somewhere to see that because, or I'm just gonna make, we can only take one shower a week and pick the day you want or something like that. So nice. we'll figure it out, but great, great presentation. Uh, the others already asked some of the questions that I was asking. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You, uh, Commissioner Bose. Yeah, uh, just to echo what my other um, colleagues have said already, really enjoyed the presentation uh, and the initiative. Um, the questions I had just were about uh, the outreach that you had uh, outlined in your presentation. Uh, you mentioned, I think, um, reaching out uh, to targeted customers who you see as already potentially, um, um, you know, experiencing a greater share of, of the increases. Um, and I noticed, I think in another slide you had, I think it was the school, um, the school district, the university, and I can't remember another institutional user. Um, so what is your kind of, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. What's your sort of sense? Have you already um, kind of thought of, I'm imagining there will be some pushback, especially given um, what was the figure that you said institutional users were down 30% this year and uh, home users up 10%, something like that. So I'm just wondering yeah. if you can talk through a little bit about what uh, you had a, what I would say somewhat ambitious rollout to adoption. Uh, which is great, um, but I'm just imagining that there might be a little bit of back and forth. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think that we had really great stakeholder engagement in the fall when we um, did some outreach then. Um, UVM came, some other places came. So I think part of it will be reminding people that, you know, we've given them some information the targeted outreach, you know, will be direct with those folks, um, sending letters, emails, we'll be setting up meetings with them. Um, we do have, you know, all the social media sort of stuff we're going to do, notes on the bills, things like that, obviously taking time if anyone needs to speak with me or Megan individually, besides the other open house that we're going to be holding. It is robust and it's going to be a little challenging in this virtual world as opposed to just having someone come in um, or taking that time to meet with people. Um, I'm trying to, I'm blanking right now, sorry. Well, I think, I mean, I mean, yeah, sorry. one thing, I, one thing the, again, just, well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one thing is we are going to be taking the time, right? If somebody comes in and requests their bill impact of looking at what the impact is and looking at what the um, contributing factors are, how many fire services you had. Okay, you have a three inch meter, but you never actually use that amount of water. You're eligible for a smaller meter. Like we're gonna do everything within our power to get them to the right bill. Um, it may still be more than they are currently paying. And a lot of that is educating people about the fact that really none of us are paying the true value and cost of water. Um, and that, that is just a reality. And it's a reality that I think communities across the nation are really reckoning with. Um, and of course, it's coming at a time when we're realizing the, the true cost and value of so many other things that we haven't been paying for. So um, I think it's a careful conversation and then a deliberate stepping through that individual customer's um, characteristics that are affecting their bill. Uh, and I mean, actually, that leads into my last point, which is when you put together whatever these kinds of communications and discussions, are, I would really um, recommend taking elements of the presentation you gave us and translating that into whatever kind of, I don't know, pamphlets, handouts, whatever it is, because I actually thought that was a particularly effective 
um, part of this communication was to lay that out. Um, you know, in different parts of this presentation, you kind of talked about industry standards and how this kind of works across the country, but it was also very effective to be able to show like, look, this is everything from like the sizes of pipes or whatever. I mean, that's quite, uh, it doesn't come across as arbitrary. I mean, at this point, a lot of times when we, we get the rates or whatever, it's, I'm not entirely sure what that's based on. And this was a really nice explanation of that. So if there are ways of, of translating that into, you know, easy to, to um, grasp, graphics as you sort of had up there, I would encourage that. Anyway, great work, thank you. Thank you for that feedback, that's a great idea. Commissioner Gilman. Yeah, my comment, I mean, is related to what Commissioner Bose just said. It, I thought the presentation did a good job of laying out drawing connectivity between, you know, the rates and what drives the cost of service. Um, obviously with a big change like this, it's important to get that message to as many people as possible. So obviously this is one forum for that. And uh, as Commissioner Bose said, it, good to get that to as many people as possible to you know, prevent, uh, you know, it could easily come across as, oh, they're increasing rates. You know, it's just, it's the simplest thing to say. So would uh, encourage you to get this uh, information, you know, in as many forums as you can. Otherwise, uh, I think it makes a ton of sense. So thank you. All right, thank you. Commissioner Overby. Uh, I've been reading through this since we had the original information. So I think it's, um, I completely understand where you're going with this. And I know a lot of work has gone into the, the discussion of it and the materials that we have. So I don't have any specific questions about it other than um, I think I'm following up on the comment that was made about uh, making sure the materials given to the public uh, are easy to understand and, and clear. Um, you know, we all are familiar with every time there's, you know, problems with the water, you know, or a, a, an outflow problem, people get outraged. And part of it is that we just really need to, you know, keep educating people about the fact that it is, it is um, a, a really quite a deal to have, not have to go down the, you know, down to the river and, you know, bring a bucket up and, um, and boil it. Um, so I think it's great. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to having it happen. And I know people, everything there's, every time there's a change, it, it, it is something that some people feel like uh, they're being unfairly treated. But I, I, I agree that I think all of these things that you've done are, are, are good at proposing, you know, explaining to people what is going on and how we can make it fair. Um, and so I totally support what you're up to here. And, um, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. So thank you. All right. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just one clarifying question on my end. Um, on the, you mentioned about 10% of boxes are radio equipped to be um, sort of optionally pull a larger time series. Are those like the newest 10% or? Yeah, there like are, are V4 boxes. So we started installing them about three years ago, mm -hmm. um, but we have been replacing boxes only when they fail to transmit at this point. So that's why it's a, a lower percentage. So it's new builds or ones that have failed. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's great. I think my fellow commissioners uh, brought up all of my other questions here. With that, so I'll open up to public comments. Don't see any hands in the air, but we'll uh, confirm with Mr. Golding. Um, at this time, there is nobody signed up, but for any members of the public who are still on, you can hit star nine if you have called in to join the queue for public comment, or hit uh, raise your hand on the bottom toolbar on your Zoom screen, and that will alert us that you want to uh, speak during public comment. Sure. But at this time, there does not appear to be anybody signed up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Golding. So looking ahead, we are so seeking a, a vote on this, and I gather it's generally a vote of support for this moving forward. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know that we were looking for an explicit vote, but we will certainly take one. Um, certainly helps us as we move forward, and more. It's you just your advocacy as people start to talk to you about this. Mm -hmm. Really emphasizing that this is all about 
maintaining access to that essential life water that every resident, you know, the UN lists access to water as a human right. And that's what we're trying to present. Um, and so, you know, when you talk to the commercial folks who may be experiencing an increase in bill, if you can kind of draw them back to that and, and get that agreement on that value proposition, because I don't think anybody would disagree that people should have enough water to wash their hands, you know, clean their clothes and, and cook their food. Absolutely. Uh, Director Spencer, are we going to comment and we're listed in the agenda as yeah. a, a vote? Exactly. Well, I've been erring on the side of listing things as votes just so that the commission has uh, flexibility in how it wants to weigh in. We would certainly welcome, you know, your guidance or input. Uh, in terms of uh, affirmation uh, motion, but uh, it is not required. Sure. Is anyone moved or inspired to make such a motion? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll move to approve, uh, I, what do I say, staff's language? <laughs> That'd be the right the proposal. I just want to keep it simple. Yeah, I would say that it supports the, the general direction of the water rate restructuring and affordability program. Uh, it's not a formal proposal at this point, but just a general support of your direction would be well. Okay, what he said, I, that's my motion. I second that. Second by Vice Chair Neal, all right. Is there any discussion around that motion? All right, I'll go uh, call roll for this one then. Uh, Commissioner Archambault. Aye. Commissioner Barr. Aye. Commissioner Bose. Aye. Commissioner Gilman. Aye. Commissioner o Vice Chair O'Neill. Aye. Commissioner Overby. Aye. Aye for myself. The motion in support of this direction has passed unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's good practice for getting eyes from everybody else. Yes. <laughs> and good luck moving forward with this. Thank you. Right. I'll see you guys in a bit. Genesis item six, parking request for South End Green Stormwater Infrastructure. Yay, it's me again. Yeah. Oh. Back. Remember me? <laughs> um, okay, so I am sharing again. Can everybody wait? Can you see the presentation? Not yet. Oh, I have to click share. That would be helpful. Incoming. Okay. Um, so I'm here tonight. I will be joined um, by Philip Peterson towards the end um, just to talk about the actual parking changes. But I'm just here to talk to you a bit about the Green Stormwater Infrastructure CSO Mitigation Project um, and to hopefully get a, a favorable vote to adjust parking for this project. So um, as a reminder, I think I have, I have spoken to some of you about it. I can't recall exactly off the top of my head right now if we've come to commission about this before. Um, but as many of you probably recall, 2018 was a particularly challenging year for water quality in Burlington. Um, we had a series of combined sewer overflow issues, a lot of rain, um, several infrastructure issues with our wastewater treatment um, plants and our combined sewer infrastructure. And um, this was when the city passed the $30 million Clean Water Resiliency Plan uh, bond vote. Um, in uh, further response to that, that summer, we applied for and uh, were awarded a million dollars, just over a million dollars in match free grant funding from Vermont DEC in late 2018, which was specifically um, targeted toward mitigating combined sewer impacts with the use of green stormwater infrastructure. So um, Pine Street CSO is by and large our most problematic CSO or combined sewer overflow in the city. Um, it also happens to have a very discrete drainage area. Um, the, the area you see circled below is the one that we're actually talking about tonight. There is one area just to the north, an additional area, but it is um, just in the vicinity of Ledge Road, which as you may suspect, is characterized generally by um, very shallow ledge, high groundwater and or heavy clay soils, which, is, um, which are conditions not suitable for infiltrating water um, with green stormwater infrastructure. Uh, it just so happens that the area highlighted in red that you see does have soil conditions that are favorable for green stormwater infrastructure and um, therefore that is where we um, pursued this initial design. 
So the project involves overall the installation of 13 rain garden bump out systems, which are designed to maximize receiving drainage from the surrounding roadways. Um, in the end, this project will, these, the, the series of projects will provide a net reduction of 10 cubic feet per second of runoff during a 2.7 inch rainfall event, which is um, what the state roughly considers a combined sewer overflow storm. Um, they do go off in smaller events, and so the systems, you know, are designed to um, mitigate those smaller events as well. The, the highlight here is that these systems will be able to intercept and mitigate stormwater runoff from roughly six acres of impervious surface, or just about 28% of the area that currently drains directly through the Pine Street CSO um, via the combined sewer areas contributing to these overflow events. So it is not an insubstantial um, benefit that these projects will provide to the um, Pine Street CSO. This is just a highlight of the, the system locations. So as you'll see, there are three here on South Prospect, another three on Lower South Prospect, just at the corner of Prospect Parkway. This is Prospect Parkway. There is one on Prospect Parkway, another that sort of wraps around Prospect Parkway and Fairmount, one on Fairmount Street um, here, another on Fairmount Street just at the, um, the edge of Holt. This is actually South Burlington. Um, so we're right on the edge. Then another just on the corner of South Street and Holt, and then two others on um, South Street right here. So we've done a significant amount of design and outreach for this project over the course of the last year, um, really two years. So we started in July of 2019 with notifying residents via Front Porch Forum that um, design teams would be out just conducting soil borings in advance of design for this project. In March of 2020, we did a presentation to the Ward 6 um, NPA and mailed a letter directly to um, neighborhood residents about the project. Then the world came to a screeching halt. So in April of 2020, we sent a direct email to all the residents that we had emails for and did another front porch forum update on the project delays due to COVID-19 and then uh, revitalized everything in uh, June of 2020. So in June, we, well, I, it, okay, in June, we mailed a second letter to residents and Councillor Paul actually handed out um, project flyers to residents. Um, myself and the rest of the project team also went out and marked out where the proposed systems would be in chalk paint so residents could actually see them on the ground. And then following that process, we hosted a series of four Zoom meetings over, the, over two days um, to inform residents and accept feedback. We did, um, we did receive a significant amount of feedback during that process. And so this gap that you see between July and December was actually um, the process of our team making some pretty significant design revisions to the project in response to neighborhood concerns. So come December of 2020, the residents were notified via email of the project changes that we made. This notification including, included all the upcoming meeting links explaining those changes further. And we held another two meetings um, for folks explaining the design changes. In January of this year, so just a few weeks back, we made the direct notification you know, per our internal process to all of the abutting residents of the parking changes um, and in addition to that, did put out a front porch forum post to the entire neighborhood about the parking changes. Um, and, you know, all of the updates are available on the project web page. So here's just a, a, an overall summary of the design changes of the adjustments that we made um, in response to the feedback that we received last July. Um, one system on South Prospect Street was removed entirely. Two of the systems on South Prospect were reduced in size and traffic analysis were completed. Um, Prospect Parkway and Fairmount Street, we removed two systems. Uh, one system was adjusted to add subsurface infiltration thanks to more advanced soil borings that we were able to gather. One system was um, reduced in length and another traffic analysis was completed. And then on South Street, um, two of those systems were um, reduced in size. So overall, you know, based on, on Philip and our traffic team's analysis, 
this is the overall parking change summary. Um, these are the systems, you know, the, the, the number of parking on street parking spaces that would be removed and then the distance to nearest on street parking um, at, you know, as a result. So if you, if you look on the column to the right, this, this between 875 and 865 South Prospect Street, um, there are four spaces removed directly in front of that home, but the, the nearest on street parking closest to those residences um, is 77 feet away. So it's, it's really not that significant of a removal when you look at it in context to where the nearest on street parking is um, outside of that immediate area right in front of the home. So our next steps will be hopefully in early February 2021, obviously pending the outcome of, of this discussion, um, issuing our request for bids, hopefully awarding that bid in late February of this year, going through all of the Board of Finance and City Council approvals to execute a contract through um, from March to April, and then um, from May to June uh, in that window generally beginning construction. So I did try to keep this brief. Again, Philip is with me, so um, we can both answer questions related to the parking impact specifically, but um, I am happy to answer any questions now, um, or you can reach out to me directly if you'd like. Okay, hey, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, um, Commissioner Gilman, just start. Yeah, the, the one question, I, I don't know if as part of this, I'm assuming the answer is that it's not an issue, but I don't like to assume. So um, the total parking utilization in those neighborhoods uh, is typically something we consider when we look at removing parking um, meaning if we're removing 60 spots out of 200 and typically parking is only 20% utilized, then obviously that's probably not a problem. Um, I understand the distance data, so that was helpful. Uh, I'm assuming you left the other out just because it's not an issue in that neighborhood. Philip, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I would characterize parking in this neighborhood. We don't have specific numbers on it but it's more of a suburban street. This is not an old North End street. It's not a narrow street. It's not like a, a Russell and Charles situation where people are packed in like sardines. Um, they have quite a bit of uh, parking resources. Um, pretty much all of the homes have driveways. They can park multiple cars. Um, so I would say that parking resources is, is abundant in this neighborhood. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in the future, just generally, if we're going to take parking away, it would be useful to just say once at 6 PM on a weekday night, you have a count just to say, yeah, we're fine. I don't think it needs to be a comprehensive multi-time multi-scenario study. You guys know when people are in residential neighborhoods, that would be useful. We can take in. Thanks. Commissioner, I think in this case, we uh, didn't do that because the utilization is so low on the yeah, streets. I, that it I, I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I know the neighborhood, so I'm not, I'm not, uh, I assumed that was the case. That's why I said it. But again, just generally, I think, you know, even a 1x just spot check would be, would be helpful. Thanks. It's a fair question. And it is agree. something that Jen and I discussed uh, what the occupancy rates are, but to Chapin's point, that's the reason we didn't put in the extra effort. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Um, Vice Chair O'Neill. Hi there. So I'm sorry, I'm looking at two screens. Um, I guess, I guess um, just looking at the design change summary and how you've eliminated um, three three systems and adjusted size of four, five, six, seven. Um, does, this, does this project still meet the goals of, of capturing the stormwater? Um, I mean, certainly, certainly less so, um, but how does it, you know, what are, what, are we, what are we losing from keeping some of this parking? And, and I guess also then what was some of the feedback from the residents? Was it purely parking or were there other issues? 
Um, there were other issues. It was, uh, it was, a, it was kind of a mixed bag. I would be more than happy to send the commission our um, more robust response summary afterward. Um, there, there was significant concern about aesthetic of the neighborhood. Um, we addressed that with the response summary. In terms of the design changes, what I can say is that the, the reason why we were able to eliminate and adjust the size of those systems was because we were able to um, gather advanced site data and ensure that the, um, the design parameters of the project wouldn't be impacted. So, you know, the, the, the first thing that came to mind when we, when we took this feedback into account is, you know, how is this going to eat into our treatment goals? Because obviously the, there is a very limited area where we can utilize green stormwater infrastructure to manage Pine Street CSO. And we didn't want to lose that opportunity um, in a huge way. And, and we didn't. So that is why we were able to make the adjustments we did. Um, we certainly didn't win all of the residents over. Some are still, you know, bummed out that the system in front of their home wasn't adjusted or wasn't changed more. The reason for that was very specific to site conditions. You know, we, we placed these systems in the low points of the neighborhood in order to maximize the area of capture. And so if a system wasn't adjusted or wasn't changed in a specific way, it's because it happened to be in a location that's capturing a very large drainage area um, and we needed to maintain that, so. Okay, thank you, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, that's all. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Overby. I think my questions were sort of related to that, but primarily was uh, conceptually when you design these are, I can't tell what the, the contour uh, is of that area. And in fact, do you um, put the, 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 the garden or the facility in a place where you're going to get the, the, you know, a, a huge runoff of water coming down the hill? I couldn't tell from the maps. Um, you know how you make those decisions because I, I'm very familiar with how those water the water comes rushing down Main Street and was you know going into Mr. Mike's now just that kind of river and and I'm visioning that, that does this happen on these streets and when you design the locations of these things it's not obvious to me the way you're going on this and that side that it where the contour is are they is can you just sort of it has nothing to do with parking obviously but it does have to do with my curiosity about how you decided where to place these. Yeah, so um, what, what you'll notice is that the systems often coincide with an existing catch basin, that, that's intentional. So our drainage network is specifically designed in order to capture um, the low points of areas. The, the road is crowned a certain way, the roads are pitched a certain way, and then catch basins are placed in locations where they're going to capture drainage coming downhill. And so, um, as I was sort of alluding to before, the, the location of these systems is not coincidental. Um, it, we didn't just kind of pick, it. it was hard to explain that to residents in a lot of cases because obviously they're in very defined spaces and I think sort of easy to feel picked on, but these are in low points of the road and um, these were specifically designed in the areas that were lowest and therefore um, able to capture the most runoff in those neighborhoods. So. But, but are there, I mean, it may be that those catch basins are not in the best place, you know, from historically anyway. I mean, it's hard to know. So, you know, and some of them look like they were on either side. So you pretty much, I couldn't, I honestly did not notice that they were where existing catch basins were. Right? The diagrams are fairly challenging for me to read. Yeah. Um, but so you basically put them in a place where there was a catch basin that already was going to getting a big direct amount of water and, and it was going to be hitting that. And you're basically in, in improving the uh, you're slowing down the amount of water dropping into that catch basin using these various mechanisms. Exactly. And I guess just to, to further clarify, it wasn't, we didn't select the location solely based on the catch basins. There was uh, extensive survey work done to make sure that this, those catch basins were in fact in the right place. That's a very good point, Commissioner Overby. They're not always in the best place. So um, they did do extensive survey work to make sure that the locations that were selected are actually low points. And one of the other things that I know there's um, one of those was placed on Grant Street uh, at the corner of Grant and North Winooski. And 
And that's one that I've had comments made to me, uh, it's a word too, um, that it, it is, um, it, it, it really does do the job. It gets a lot of water in there, but it, but it collects a lot of, you know, debris. And it also is frequently, uh, you know, struck the, the, uh, the edge is frequently struck the, the concrete barrier. So I'm not sure if any of that is something that's, um, if there's any way to, you know, uh, deal with that kind of problem. I mean, if, if, if a big, if it fills up and it doesn't actually get cleaned out periodically because you've had a big storm, is that something that you can deal with? If I hadn't had somebody complain about it, the one on Grant Street a few times, uh, because they go out there and clean it up, they live there, mm -hmm. I would not be quite wondering as much. Yeah, so we, we've we actually developed a sign of how you save us from that sort of problem. Sorry, something just broke up. I think one of my metal doodads from my sweatshirt touched my headphones and made everything crazy. Um, uh, yeah, so we we developed a municipal green stormwater infrastructure maintenance plan as a as part of this process. That was a big comment that came up was ongoing maintenance. Um, and so there is a, a systematic schedule now for making sure that these get cleaned out on a routine basis, that the mulch is replaced, that plants are replaced based on mortality. Um, you know, weeding is done on a regular basis. Um, and that includes, you know, that advanced level of maintenance that really needs to happen on stormwater systems, because as you, as you point out, you know, after a big storm, those inlets and outlets can get clogged up with leaves or sand, sediment, whatever, um, sort of a schmegma, as Megan likes to call it, gets on the road and then gets into the, the, the rain garden. Um, in terms of um, line of sight, one of the things that we've learned with these, uh, especially with the assistance of, of Philip and the other tech services folks, Nicole and Elizabeth, is that we do need to incorporate um, um, visual aids in the gardens for folks to make sure that they're abundantly clear. And so part of this design does include those, those markers, the, um, MUTCD, yeah, MUTCD yeah. standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any of the traffic markings that Dan Hill and his, his team have to make to ensure that, uh, you know, we got a safe transportation system. Yeah. The, the a lot to keep track of. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, I mean, it's truly, it needs to get done. And, um, and I'm, I'm really glad that you've got the grant to do it. Um, the other question was relating to that area. Do the, do they have trouble with sewer backups? Because they would be benefiting as people in the neighborhood to have this better handled um, to, to mitigate the, the risks of having a sewer backup into their home because of the combined sewer, uh, you know, stormwater design in that neighborhood. I don't know. I know it's came up over in another neighborhood years ago um, about that. And there are instructions on how to put one of those backflow protectors in, but did that come up uh, as far as a, an advantage that, that the neighborhood will see by having this work done? Um, no, we didn't actually hear from any residents that that was an issue that folks face. This is actually one of our newer neighborhoods. A lot of the sewage backups that we see are, are in the lower portions of the city and also in the areas of the city that have much older homes that wouldn't have had backwater prevention originally. Um, uh, most of these homes are sort of 1950s era and newer. And so I think most of them do have backwater pre prevention valves. So um, we didn't hear that from residents. You know, this this certainly will help with that issue. We did um, receive some feedback about folks being concerned with water coming into their basements. Um, water flows, you know, to the, to the favorable path. And so these systems will hopefully alleviate that, that issue that a lot of folks are seeing. So um, we did describe that to residents as much as possible. Okay, the, the one last thing is where is the Pine Street um, outfall? Where does it come out into the lake? Um, it actually discharges just behind the DPW building at 645 Pine into the Pine Barge Canal, and then it travels up the Pine Barge Canal to the lake. So it, it's not actually a direct discharge, like onto a beach, as a lot of folks, I think, believe. Um, but it, it goes into that, um, that super fun site, and then that ultimately flows right. through the lake. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Those are all my questions. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Archambault. Any 
Questions for you? Yeah. Hi there. Uh, just a quick comment. It's interesting to see the CSOs mentioned and that this project effectively, in my mind's eye, directly relates to uh, mitigating beach closings, right? And, and those problems that we seem to face. But Jenna, you tell me if I'm wrong. Is that, what's your assessment on that? Yeah, I mean, with the with the CSOs, you know, we're explicitly required to, under state statute, um, put permanent signage at all the CSO outfalls, which of course nobody's really going to see the one for Pine Street because it's behind the DPW building. So unless you're rooting around in the woods back there, you're not really going to see that sign. Um, but we also put signage out on the nearby beaches um, after every. CSO event at Pine Street, and um, it does impact usage of our beaches. You know, whether whether we are mandated to close them or not, it has an impact on how folks, um, you know, perceive our beach water quality, and it also, you know, can impact that acute level of E. coli, depending on, you know, depending on the the amount of the discharge or you know what event is happening. So hands down, there is um, a, a very clear nexus between this work and um, water quality and our beach usage, you know, throughout the summer. I think everyone can agree that um, Burlington is, is heavily dependent on tourism revenue. And every time we end up in the news because of a CSO or some sort of wastewater discharge, it impacts the usage of our beaches and our other um, really key resources here in Burlington. So. We yeah. want people to keep coming back. We want them to shop. We want them to spend their money here. We want them to park and, and spend money to BPRW, you know, parking at our beaches. We want um, them to go scuba diving. Yeah, we want them to go scuba diving. We want them to get yeah. snacks at North Beach. So, um, you know, this is this, this is a meaningful, this is certainly a meaningful improvement and um, it, it will move the needle for us, I think. And when this is all done, as you know, we're encountering more severe storm events. So how would this hold up under those type of conditions with the severe storm events? Yeah, I mean, the, the maintenance contract is certainly, um, is certainly designed to address, you know, any, any impacts the system may see because of really heavy flows. So if there's, you know, erosion or any scouring or something like that, we are equipped to address it. Um, you know, again, these systems are really designed, it's hard to, it's hard to design to those really flashy, um, high intensity, short duration events, but that is what we're trying to do here. I mean, we're, we're trying to cut that peak as much as we possibly can. And, and that's the, the goal here is to, you know, take off that big deluge and either, um, remove it entirely or slow it down enough so that the system can catch up with the amount of water that's rushing in during a storm event. Um, so that the CSO doesn't discharge and that everything can get to our main wastewater treatment plant and be processed um, how the plant is designed to process it. Yeah. So. Well, well, versus where it's going today, right? Is it flowing down the hill onto what, what Route 7? Yeah, well, right right now it's combined. It is, it's combined. And so, okay. you know, right right now, if it were just to sprinkle a little bit, um, all of that water would end up at the wastewater treatment plant. It's it, the problems arise really when there is a big amount of rainfall and there's so much stormwater and wastewater in the pipe um, that the system can't handle it. And that's when the overflow happens. I just want to make one, this is part and parcel of a larger portfolio. This, this project is going to help a great deal um, to the best of our abilities using green stormwater infrastructure practices. Very soon we will be coming back, and if any of you attended the um, the integrated planning outreach that Jenna did uh, last fall, um, we talked about some other practices that we're going to have to employ. Largely, a subsurface storage tank uh, at Callahan Park, which would be a big lift and a multi-million dollar lift, but would even further reduce, um, you know, up to hopefully a five-year return frequency storm. But, but they are locked hand in hand. We need this as well as things like tanks and other practices in order to achieve our ultimate goal of really not having the CSO happen, you know, except once in a blue moon. Yeah, right out, Megan. As usual, you're two steps ahead of me, right? I was just gonna mention that these types of projects are gonna be so beneficial to our town as we move forward in the future for mitigating those, those impacts. So, so it's great. Yeah, thank you. And I, I see you 
no longer being attacked by a water bear. So I'm glad to see that back. <laughs> That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. I think our chairperson might be frozen. Did we lose Commissioner Hogan? He looks like he's frozen. He hasn't moved in a long while, so. <laughs> we have a frozen chair. <laughs> I want to check his pulse. Oh, dear. <laughs> How about, do we have, uh, do we have Vice Chair O'Neill on the? We do, yeah. Uh, we do. Chair Hogan uh, just rejoined. Here we go. OK, there it goes. It's all you. <laughs> back. Sorry for the uh, network. Left yeah. there. All right. <laughs> Thank you for the questions, uh, Chair Archibald. Um, Commissioner Barr. Yeah. Thanks. Just very quickly. I mean, it. I guess it helps to go last because everybody asks all those pertinent questions. Um, I, I only had a couple of little, I don't know if they're questions or comments. I should, I don't know if I should know this, but is there residential parking program in effect in any of these um, affected areas? Philip? I'll let Philip take that one. Yeah. You kind of cut it. out there. Sorry. Um, no, I'm asking if, if there is a, a residential parking program in effect for any of these areas that will be affected. No, no, there is no resident parking and they're not in a designated zone that even could be. Okay. And there are there. None of these streets are uh, narrow streets either. Uh, so no other special circumstances there. Not in a trucking route, just uh, kind of like your basic suburban streets. Yep. I'm Pretty familiar with that area there. I used to yeah. walk and bike down through there and had some friends that lived down there too. So I guess, you know, other than the feedback from the neighbors, which you've kind of alluded to, Jenna, and, and thanks. Um, I, I'm looking at the picture next to the questions thing and it, it looks like I'm in Arizona or something. I, I'm just curious if that's, if that's what the look is gonna be, the vibe that we're gonna be bringing in the neighborhood. Uh, not necessarily, no. So this is actually uh, St. Paul Street, but this was in the very early establishment phase. These gardens look really different now. It's just okay. that in the summertime when we can get pictures, the, the gardens aren't always, um, th these are really, really nice gardens on St. Yes. Paul Street. And so they photograph super well, just in terms of, you know, the, the curving and everything. Um, but yeah, the vegetation is not fully grown in this one. Okay. Um, the planting plans, you know, the, the designer did develop planting plans. One of the, one of the things that we're working with, um, with the residents is allowing them to select plants for the systems that are directly in front of their homes if they want to. You know, the, again, as I was saying earlier, there are a lot of aesthetic, there were a lot of aesthetic concerns and that was sort of one of our olive branches was that it really doesn't matter to me what plants you select, so long as they're suitable to live in a rain garden. Um, we, there is an entire Vermont rain garden manual that we provided out to residents and several of them took us up on it and um, we'll be selecting plants that will, um, we will then develop planting plans for them just so it you know, sort of blends a little bit better with their landscaping, so. All right, well, it looks great and I can't wait to get this in the old East End on Great. this the Burlington too on my street yeah. so thank you <laughs> thanks yeah thank you um, commissioner bose anything on your end no questions from me thanks all right um uh, i guess brings it back to myself um yeah, that's really cool that um, residents even got a chance for input on their type of their favorite type of uh water retaining plant uh is the construction all planned to complete this season like this year coming up yeah, so it, it, it really needs to happen this summer. We were able to get an extension on the grant, um, but that's only, that only gets us until the end of next summer. And um, this is actually the first half of the project. So the second half will be in the old North End um, because of the subsurface conditions being so incredibly sandy in the old North End, those systems will be um, all or you know 90 to 99% underground. So um, we probably won't need the nearly the same level of engagement on that, um, but we do, we need to get those constructed next summer. So um, yeah, there is a limited time frame, and we, we really do need to advance construction on these this year. Gotcha. Yep. So this obviously the parking restrictions would not be instituted until construction was definitely underway. We would not just, you know, start instituting parking restrictions. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for clarifying. So we, we would potentially vote to approve these restrictions today, but you would you would hold it from publishing it until uh, till the time is right this spring. That is correct. Sounds good. All right, uh, that will close out commissioner discussion. Uh, are there any public commenters, prospective public commenters? Not at this time, Chair Hogan. All right, thank you. So we back to uh, the commission for a vote here. We're seeking the commission's approval on the uh, the traffic changes, and parking restrictions to support these um, these developments. Can I yeah. remove the uh, the presentation so we can see everybody? Yep. Thanks. All right. Uh, so I, I was going to move. I believe there is language on this one in particular. So I guess in this case, I will move to uh, approve staff's language. Thank you. Seconded. I miss it. Who was in with the second? Commissioner Barr. Commissioner Barr. <laughs> I'll let you have it. <laughs> gotcha. We have a motion from Commissioner Archambault, second by Commissioner Barr. Is there any discussion around that motion? All right. So we'll uh, call roll on the vote here. Commissioner Archambault. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Barr. Aye. Commissioner Bose. Aye. Commissioner Gilman. Aye. Vice Chair O'Neill. Aye. Commissioner Overby. Aye. Aye for myself. All right. The motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time tonight, commissioners. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, Jenna. Thank I you. Just, I just want to give a huge thanks to Jenna. This has been a, a challenging project just to manage all of the concerns, and she has done so much work. Um, and thank you for your all's support. But I just wanted to publicly thank Jenna for really doing an awesome job on this. Thanks, Megan. You're here. It is noted. Thank you. Thanks, folks. All right. Moving forward, item seven on our agenda, asset management. Good evening, everybody. It, it, it is a, a good and big here. evening. And uh, I just wanna say uh, that last uh, item was about proactive planning on the team water uh, and the item before. This one too is a partnership between team water and team technical services. So you're gonna get to hear from uh, both teams on this one. Outstanding. From that, he took a little of my thunder away, but we are really excited that this is a really collaborative project and we are coming to you tonight with our next steps. This process started in 2014 when we started talking about asset management. And Megan had the great luck of going first in 2016. She started working on an asset management plan and that was really fun, but the general fund couldn't join in at that time. We weren't organized enough. And in 2019, we added an asset management administrator, which is Gustav, who will be speaking in a moment. Hopefully he is there, thank you. And uh, we are now here, we've done a lot of research and a lot of planning, and we're here to come forward with a a great project to actually implement asset management for the city of Burlington involving everybody. And so I'm gonna let Megan speak, but I'm really excited and uh, we've got a great team here. Yeah. Thanks Martha, and I'm just here um, in support. Super, super excited. There's been times during this project, the recent phases where I've literally, this might be revealing my nerddom, not been able to sleep at night because of my level of excitement of how this is going to transform how we take care of assets. Um, we do an amazing job given the tools we have, but this is the missing tool in our toolbox. Um, it's been great to collaborate with Martha and Gustav. Um, we have our own staff. Um, Greg Johnson left us, but we have imported somebody from California, Rocky Vogler, who I believe is listening in. Um, so we are we are ready to rock and roll on this with your support, and I cannot wait to uh, hear your comments and questions and support and feedback uh, at the end of this presentation. And we stole Gustav, and so Gustav is our new employee 
from parks. So we stole him from parks and I'm thrilled to have him. And he has done a great job of moving this forward. So I'm gonna let him do the presentation. Okay, uh, let's get going here. All right, you seeing my PowerPoint? Great. Yes. Uh, so again, I'm Gustav Sexauer. I'm the asset management coordinator and I've been working with the city since, uh, uh, well, I guess it was two years ago now, but in my current position since uh, September. And this is kind of a culmination of everything I've been working on uh, for the past four months. So let's get into it. Um, so there's uh, various things uh, that we're requesting you to support today, but they're all part of uh, making a robust asset management system in the city. Uh, we're looking at a, a contract for a CMMS. Uh, we have a consultant that we've been working with and we would like an amendment to continue working with them. Uh, we're also trying to uh, make our GIS platform uh, more robust by hosting it and managing it with a third party. And uh, Megan and Water are working uh, to get two state revolving fund loans to help um, support the purchase of these uh, things. So uh, to give you a background uh, of our asset management, we currently have uh, a variety of different locations where assets are inventoried and work orders are stored. I, I know for work orders for different divisions, there are at least four different software systems that are being used now and uh, none of them talk to each other. Uh, we also have many work orders that are not tracked at all and we can't currently tag work orders and service requests to assets to uh, give assets that we have a history uh, of work in a succinct and easily e easily accessible way. Um, and an another component that we don't have is uh, a good asset inventory that is spatially oriented. Uh, it's hard to look at all of our assets on a map. Some are in uh, GIS now, but uh, some of the assets are not, some are in binders. Uh, so uh, as was said earlier, it's, it's been almost a decade of work that the city has put in uh, working towards better asset management. And uh, one uh, key thing that they did in the past was uh, they had Barton and Lagardis uh, investigate our asset management systems and uh, give us a report back on the current state and future recommendations. Um, and uh, one thing that they wrote that I'd like to read uh, from the report was that the current administration has prioritized reinvestment into the city's aging and underinvested assets. And the best way to avoid such an intense period of large capital, large capital expenditures in the future is with a robust asset management system. So that was really one of the, the key points that they made in their report is that we need uh, this asset management system and the computerized asset management system, CMMS, uh, EAM, that's the, the industry standard and the way to go from here. Um, there are many tangible benefits that they laid out that we will get from having this new system, which, uh, include uh, having improved effectiveness in um, capital, capital improvement planning by doing the right thing to the right asset at the right time, uh, extending asset life uh, through using a new asset management system, um, which is done through having uh, more optimal uh, preventative maintenance done on assets, um, lower borrowing costs, improved staff morale, increased performance and reduced maintenance costs by going from reactive maintenance to having proactive maintenance work plans, 
energy savings because assets will be running at higher efficiency and using less power. Um, and just by having higher quality data, you end up making better decisions um, over time by having actual data to back up what you're doing. So the main takeaway from their report was that um, was this that that we could be saving um, you know up, up to 20 percent in our annual capital requirements once the system gets up and running, which there is you know initial startup cost, but um, pretty quickly you can start seeing savings from those reasons that I just listed out. So just a quick as, little just gust of I want to say quick thing is that our capital budget annually is between 20 and 30 million dollars. So you can do the math on the savings. That's great. And I'd say Gustav, just keep uh, rolling through it. Uh, I think we'll have this presentation online for folks to look at in more detail, but I'd say hit the wave tops given the hour. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we we put on RFP to, to get the CMMS this fall. Um, we got 19 responses and uh, we ended up interviewing four of the vendors. Um, we also uh, did our due diligence and uh, called up different municipalities and utilities that were using these uh, using these softwares to see uh, how they were liking them and if there were any red flags that came up. Um, and after the four uh, demonstrations that we received, uh, we had several meetings with staff from many divisions in DPW, uh, BPRW, and the airport, and uh, we narrowed it down to data transfer solutions, uh, which goes by DTS as our preferred vendor. Um, we have also kept uh, BED and the school district uh, up to date on our activities in case they uh, would be interested in joining us in this asset management adventure. So uh, DTS's CMMS is called Buworks, and it can handle um, pretty much all municipal assets from horizontal uh, things like pipelines that are easily shown in a map to uh, facility equipment, which would be uh, stored uh, as a vertical asset, which would be in a um, more of like a file structure folder and you would be able to look at it that way. Uh, it also stores uh, work orders and service requests and those get tied directly to assets so you can easily look up the history uh, of assets or even asset components if it was, uh, you know, a, a tank that was a component of a boiler, you could have that be a child asset and you could look at the total cost of that or you could roll it up to the, uh, the greater cost of the full asset. Uh, we can also do inspections in this system and uh, one reason that we, in particular, we liked Viewworks over the other uh, systems that we looked at was that uh, there were uh, robust uh, risk assessment uh, tools and uh, capital planning scenario uh, capabilities. So the next few slides, you're gonna see just some screenshots of Viewworks just so you can get an idea of what it looks like. But uh, basically it, it's very map based and you can uh, turn on which assets you wanna look at at a given time or look at work orders and service requests. So that's what all the circles are there with the W in them. Um, and uh, another benefit of it is that you can uh, look at it through uh, desktop through an internet browser, or you can use a mobile device, which is gonna be key for uh, field staff inputting information. 
another benefit of using ViewWorks would be collaboration and awareness across departments. You could see which assets are where in the field, and you can easily um, uh, set up work orders that would trigger other departments to come and uh, work on maybe a separate task within a work order that you already have going. So say if water department was, or water division was uh, doing some work, but they uh, messed up some pavement, they could uh, easily tag the street crew that there needs to be uh, a patch put in. Uh, so the easy use for field staff is obviously a, a very high priority and one of our top requirements. Uh, this is a view on an iPad. Um, you can look uh, once again at the map view and you can easily pull up a priority of uh, or work orders in order of priority that are assigned to you uh, if you are on the field crew. Um, And you can also utilize your device's um, capability of uh, speech to text. And basically we just wanna make it as easy as possible for field staff to be putting in information because we know if you know, you're know you writing it down or just waiting until the end of the day to put it in, uh, some of that information is going to be lost and uh, or forgotten and uh, then our system will get out of date and uh, not have the real-time data that we really want out of it. So by making it easy for the field staff, we'll, we'll be successful. Uh, one major thing that we'll be doing with the new CMMS is trying to change from reactive maintenance where we just you know hear about problems and then go after them uh, and switching to proactive maintenance. So ViewWorks is a, does a great job of giving you options of how to set up proactive maintenance. You can, uh, you know, you could set up a monthly check on an asset that you need to do, and it would, you know, automatically make a, a work order for you uh, to go look at it, or you could set it uh, off of run hours um, or flow rates from SCADA. Um, there, there's just a lot of different ways you can do it. And you can even set exclusions for seasons so that you wouldn't be using things like if a cooling tower is not operational in the winter, you wouldn't be uh, doing your normal monthly checks that you would during its operating season. Um, so asset life cycle costs, uh, there's few different components listed there. Uh, these are all uh, pretty easy to put in when you're uh, looking at a work order and, and uh, closing it out. You can uh, tag members of the team, as you can see in the, the middle of the image there, that we're working on a given project and uh, you know set if they were working on a regular day or a holiday, and that'll easily calculate the uh, labor costs that went into uh, working on that work order for that asset. So part of the uh, risk analysis is that you can uh, use inspections in ViewWorks to track condition, and then you can uh, bring up charts like this where you would look uh, at the actual condition versus the manufacturer's deterioration curve to see uh, how the asset is doing, and uh, if it warrants uh, more repairs to get it up to standards or not. Another thing that is very important, and uh, if you want to nerd out about it, you can talk to Megan, but <laughs> looking at the likelihood uh, of risk versus the consequence of risk for each asset, uh, something that we would we would like to be able to do in many instances. And uh, ViewWorks gives us a way to uh, house these scores and look at them uh, 
in relation to a map and actually see, you know, where are where are the pipes that uh, are the highest um, highest risk and need to be replaced sooner rather than later. So, uh, for the ease of reporting, this is just a sample dashboard. There are many different uh, widgets that you can use in ViewWorks to, to see uh, real-time readouts. Um, and they're, they're pretty handy. You can just click on things, like you could click on uh, facility work orders and then it would take you to the map so you could see the facility work orders in real time. Any um, attribute stored in ViewWorks is easy to query uh, to make reports. Um, and, um, We'll get on to improved cost tracking. So they they also have uh, reporting uh, that's can help with future planning, uh, such as the sample you see here. Uh, you can put in uh, your specifications, such as if you wanted uh, to keep your assets running at eighty percent efficiency, uh, then it would give you uh, the potential uh, or the proposed costs to keep them at that level. Um, and as the, the longer we use the system, the more actual data we'll have in it, and then the more accurate it will become. So basically, we'll have uh, not just some sort of standard industry number, but we'll have the actual um, reality of how assets fare uh, in Burlington based on our um, numbers. So another thing that ViewWorks uh, can do is integrate with other uh, with other software, and we we would like to use them uh, for that with a variety of our existing software that we do not want to replace. Although we will replace some of it, um, but C Click Fix is one that we would like to keep, and by doing this, we keep the user experience the same um, for citizens who use it. Uh, but the neat thing that it does is that ViewWorks can uh, listen for issues to be reported on uh, C-Click Fix, and then it will automatically make a work order that can then be handled through uh, ViewWorks by our staff. And then once we close it out, it can automatically push that information back to C-Click Fix to uh, send any comments uh, that were part of the problem resolution and close out the service request there. Uh, so here's just a list of some of the other uh, programs that we would like to integrate with ViewWorks. And uh, for example, when someone has a dig safe request, it could come into ViewWorks and turn into a work order. Uh, Granite XP uh, is a way is a program that we use to inspect pipelines, and that information and condition reports can come into ViewWorks. So there's a lot of different ways that that uh, we would like to use it with our existing software. So moving on to KCI, they have already helped uh, the city with tasks zero, one, and two. Uh, of their contract that was awarded last year. And um, that uh, dealt with uh, project initiation for uh, getting the CMMS, uh, the procurement and the selection. But now uh, as it calls for in their contract, we need to do an amendment to define uh, task three. And uh, that scope of work is centered around uh, the implementation and oversight of the CMMS now that we have a selection. Um, one nice thing about uh, this amendment is that their quote um, has come in uh, under what they originally um, quoted us at. So uh, we're 
working well with them so far and we would like to continue that. Um, for the GIS uh, hosting and management component, we have been talking with uh, innovation and technology and they do not believe that the current uh, city uh, owned servers will be able to uh, last the five years that the DTS contract would last. Uh, they're already nearing end of life and uh, they uh, would prefer to go with a third party hosting and management system, which would take some of the strain off of uh, INT who are a bit understaffed at the time and um, we're actually already looking into doing this before uh, we got into the CMMS discussions. Uh, in, in 2019, they reached out uh, to three different vendors to see uh, the pricing of um, getting our GIS hosted in the cloud, which would be a more uh, secure place to store our data. And uh, they identified Rock Technologies as their um, preferred vendor, but we're still um, in the process of figuring out uh, which vendor we would like to uh, go with at this point. There we go. Uh, so a timeline from here, we're going to go uh, after we seek your support, we're going to Tuke uh, and then uh, Board of Finance and City Council after that. Um, if all goes as planned, we would like to start the ViewWorks implementation in mid-February and they have about a 12 month time frame uh, from their kickoff to having um, all four of the asset groups, which we defined uh, live in the system. So uh, we've kind of broken it up by divisions and readiness uh, of the different divisions. And uh, we would have hopefully some, uh, some good results to show in, in September and have uh, groups across uh, DPW and parks up and running uh, by March of next year. So with that, we'll go to questions. Great, thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, back to commissioner discussion, sir, uh, Commissioner Archambault. Yeah, hi, sorry. Um, that was a lot of detail. I, I got to admit it was a little bit tough to digest a lot of that. So I appreciate the level of detail that is necessary to manage the city's assets because they are astronomical. And we've known Martha through the years, you know, to, to be on top of that. So uh, I, I certainly trust that we have a good team in place to uh, take care of that. And I'm, you seem to have a, a, a command of all of those systems and I'm, I'm thankful for that. So anyway, thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Barr. I agree with Commissioner Archibald. That was a, that was a lot to take in, um, a very thorough. Uh, and I, I saw parts and pieces that just make so much sense on how to better manage the assets that we have. So uh, I, I support this. I think, I think that the team that you, we've got there is, is going to do a great job with it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bose. Uh, yeah, just echoing the, the earlier comments, very comprehensive. I was wondering if you could talk just briefly a little bit more about, um, you said that there, it's both a, uh, a web-based and an app um, so that staff would be able to update in real time. Is that, is that sort of the, the way that it would be rolled out? Yes. Yeah. Well, what you see in the, in the web version is the, basically the same that you would see in an app version. And the idea yeah. would be, again, to be able to respond more quickly in, in that fashion, 
or just be able to map on as as sort of in real time? Be, be able to visualize the assets through uh, a map form, but to also put work orders in to the assets through the map. But okay. both, yeah, both asset inventories and work orders uh, could be handled in the map view from the app or from uh, browser. Also to get I mean, the real-time real -time feedback. Right. I mean, yeah. that was kind of my, my question around it is like, is, what is the sort of the utility of that? Is it to, to keep staff sort of, is it more of a management of the, the kind of the system or what's the, the sort of logic behind that? I, I take a swing at that. It's really transformational in what it gives our field staff to be able to do. Uh, when they go out on site and they see that the catch basin is recessed six inches from the, from the pavement surface and they can look back and see it was inspected three months ago and it was only two inches, uh, then clearly we have a failure that needs to be addressed. They'll be able to see we've been at this site six times before. There's a problem that doesn't need to be, that's more substantial than a routine maintenance fix. By providing information at real time and that our field staff can capture information instantly uploaded into our database, photographing, assessing, inventorying our data and our assets, then our engineers and our planners will actually have data to work from. Right now, we have some assets that are captured in Excel spreadsheets. It's just not how we efficiently manage uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of assets uh, in Vermont's largest city. Right. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. I guess, you know, the reason that I was asking these questions is that I, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's, it's fantastic. It's a, it's a great way of also being able to troubleshoot and, and sort of um, reconstruct when there are problems. The challenge sometimes I find is in the actual input of data. I mean, you, you obviously have to have a pretty robust training system so that everybody's on the same page. Anyway, I'm just getting into the weeds here. This is very interesting. I, I don't really have any, any any real questions about it. I'm very supportive. Thank you. I think You're it's so why why we didn't do this before, right? We were kind of anxious and eager to do it, but we really had to have the team in place and the staff in place on both the general fund and the water side because mm -hmm. Gustav and our water resources asset manager, Rocky, in those early months is gonna be having to look at the data when he knows something has occurred, he needs to look at it, make sure the data got inputted correctly and provide that feedback cycle instead of us just training people once and then not checking back in on them for multiple years and realizing we haven't, we've been missing data collection opportunities. So we now have the right team to be able to implement this amazing transformational piece. Thank you. Great, right, thank you. Commissioner Gilman. Yeah, I mean, my, my comments, obviously you can't manage millions of dollars of assets without data to do that. So obviously very supportive of that. I would uh, just encourage you to uh, treat the training and uh, sort of mandatory use of the new platform as like, it's not a choice kind of a approach. Um, it's not a know, choice. Right, I understand. And I, I can tell you're all excited, so I'm, I'm not super worried about that, but you know, having gone through this before, anytime you change how someone goes about doing their work, you will find pockets of resistance that don't seem to make any sense to you as people who want the data to make good decisions with. Um, so just make sure you really put time into connecting with everyone in multiple different ways uh, because you can't, you know, obviously capture all the benefits of this if it's not being used globally. So that's, anyway. I'll get off my soapbox. That's uh, I, I do this for a living and have implemented many systems, you know, for like purposes. And you know, it's all about it's all about making sure you're connecting with the team members and helping them see what's in it for them as well as what's in it for everyone else. So um, yeah. don't don't underestimate the you know need to communicate and drive that change. Yeah, if, if I may respond to that, that was one of the things that we uh, really focused on when we called up other municipalities that were using the software. And, you know, one of the biggest hurdles is uh, getting all your staff members on board. And uh, so that's something that we've been been focusing on, uh, having people from every division uh, be a part of every step of the process, 
uh, to create buy-in now so that we can later have uh, success and, and people that are supportive in each, in each part of the city. Awesome, thanks, that's it for me. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair O'Neill. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say the training thing, I actually wrote the question down twice in two different formats, like the training and, and the investment of the time and effort to bring everyone up to speed, I think is, is so important. So it seems like you folks are, are, are dialed into that. Um, uh, and and this, looks, this looks great. There were a lot of initials in there that I was reading and trying to figure out what the heck they mean. Um, but I think it's such a, seems like such a better way to manage what we have. Um, one thing that would be great maybe for the, for the TUC, I don't need the specific numbers right now, but I would love to see like, you know, kind of quantifiable sa savings in staff time and improved schedules. Um, you know, how, how are you gonna track the, the successes um, that you're having with this, with this new system? Martha, you mentioned um, about a 20% savings just over the capital cost, which is phenomenal. I mean, like, I don't know, I don't know what the actual cost of this, but if we look at the ROI on, on this, just based on those savings, that seems, um, that seems impressive. So, you know, maybe kind of the, the back of your head thinking about what are the efficiencies you're seeing over time, but really this looks great. So. That's one of the things we really want to track and have the KPIs on is that that's one way we're going to show that we're being successful is how, how can we show the efficiencies that were created in labor and that what, what were the save, savings that we got from going from being a reactive city to a proactive city. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've done it in other places before and it's just amazing as it occurs. And it's a huge savings just in, in morale as well as in actual time and dollars. It, it makes a huge difference. Right, and then who's, how, how you guys have talked about the, the binders and the Excel sheets, um, you know, kind of keeping in mind that all that data transfer to a digital platform um, needs to be part of that equation. I know you know that, but I thought of, I believe me, we've all worked in these places where you're like, uh, who's gonna start doing the data entry? Um, <laughs> That's the <laughs> um, but anyway, good luck. Thanks for this presentation. The new commissioner engagement, we're going to give each of you an Excel spreadsheet and uh, have you <laughs> surprise. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Uh, commissioner Overby. Yes, I um, had communicated earlier uh, about some of my questions, which has very been, been very helpful, Martha. Um, and, um, and, but I wrote down a couple of other things and I do really wanna also uh, somewhat support the discussion we've had about the field workers, the people that are doing the job. This really has to be um, clearly beneficial to them because there's so, so often a system is implemented for the purpose of managers to figure out how things are going and, and you know, meeting their KPIs and meeting their, their goals. And, and in fact, the poor working person is, not getting any value out of it and it's making their life difficult. So what I heard from Director Spencer was wonderful before I even asked the question. I'm, I'm, that's, that's really gonna be what's gonna help. The, the raw data won't get in there unless the value to the person putting it in is right there. Uh, and it's not like, it, it has to be you know, in itself useful to them. And it sounds like that's truly it. Um, I also have been involved in numerous software deployment things, um, many of them unsuccessful for the lack of the buy-in. Uh, and so I've, some of my questions directly um, before the meeting um, pro pro were related to that. And, um, you know, so I, I, the one other couple quick little questions I had would be, um, how long has the ViewWorks, you know, software itself been in use? Does anybody remember how that was? Have they been around for 10 years, 20 years, three years? I want to say 1995, but I'm I'm could be off. Gustav, I thought it was uh, I thought it was 2007, but I, I don't remember the exact year. But it, it is has been at least 10 years, and we did talk to at least one municipality that have been using it that entire time. 
Yeah, that that's great because because it, it gets more mature over time based on the experiences of everybody else, which is a good thing. Um, the what's the name of a couple of the communities that are already using it that you talked with that we might know? Uh, we talked to South Portland in Maine. Um, we talked to Anne Arundel County in Maryland. Springfield um, Water Sewer. Yeah, Springfield Water and Sewer in Massachusetts. Um, One in New Hampshire. Dover. Dover. Yeah, Dover, New Hampshire. And did you talk to the, any of the communities from the other three sort of top picks? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I spoke with the, at least three for each of them. But we were we were not only looking at references that were provided by the vendor, but also uh, trying to find uh, municipalities that use the software but were not referenced, so that we could maybe get a, a clearer look at a less biased opinion of the software. And and you'll and and it sounds like I mean I totally support the concept. It really is going to make a big difference to the to the whole city. I absolutely think you it's great, and I do. I, it sounds like you've done a lot of good work to fe, to figure it out. And unfortunately, what might happen, worst case, is that yeah, hey, you find out in five years it hasn't been too great. However, you will be so much more sophisticated shoppers if you do have to find something different. So you, anytime you jump in, you you, you know you can make a mistake, and you know, but you're going to be very sophisticated shoppers, or we're going to be very happy with this, and it's just going to continue to be great. Um, the one other sort of thing that I was curious about is, um, and this is always a challenge now that we're going into the world of uh, everything being online, uh, I take it this is a software as a service product, meaning it's uh, online exclusively. There's no, you know, you just, you sign up for whatever monthly fees or annual fees, and the whole system is uh, on, you know, in a cloud environment. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. So, um, and, and then relating to that, the question is, how is disaster recovery and continuity of operations? So obviously we know things can be a little bit sketchy with, uh, with people on, on the internet and um, network problems. So are there, um, have you discussed with the company the, the way that you would have to function uh, offline and uh, usually what happens is you figure out what are your critical elements that can't be done, uh, you know, that have to be done like within a half hour or have to be done within two hours or have to be done, you know, within a day. And you have a way to make sure those are already planned in advance how you do it. Um, is there any discussion that you've had with these companies about how they have planned for that and that they are able to provide you with some guidance and support and and you're comfortable with the continuity of operations options that you have. So Gustav, I don't know if you can speak a little to that. We have done some conversation, but it's been more with our innovations department who is struggling with things kept in servers and our, our redundancy and our uh, management of our own outdated infrastructure that we have within innovations. Um, we did speak some with, uh, I believe the others, but Gustav, can you speak to DTS? Yeah, so there, there's kind of two aspects of this and I, I could have explained this better earlier, but uh, the all of the horizontal assets um, will be stored in our own GIS servers and because uh, we would like to have a better disaster uh, recovery plan and uh, services related to that. That's why uh, INT recommended that we uh, host our data in the cloud through a third party. Um, but with DTS, we, uh, we did have requirements that we uh, made sure that they checked off with on uh, how their data is stored and that would be the uh, the vertical assets that aren't spatially tied that they would be handling um, but they they've met uh, all of our requirements in regards to that and uh, you know the 
the response time that they uh, are guaranteeing in the contract and the uh, downtime percentages were were within what we were looking for. That that's great, and I just I just wanted it. It may be premature to actually be um, trying to plan it in detail, but it's really an important thing to fantasize about. What if you can't use their software, regardless of what their contract says? And what are we going to do? And which things would that be a problem? And which ones fine? We can wait a week. You know, that's really an important uh, experiment, a mental experiment. So that's where I'm getting at. What you know, that's a discussion that. You know, I'm not saying this company is worse or, or better. I'm just thinking that that's a, an important factor to think about in the process of, of this process. So the, I think that's the questions that I had. Um, and I'm I'm very supportive. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be challenging to get it going, but I would focus like we all have said, focus on making sure that the value is delivered to the field work people and then it will it will then filter up to the management to be able to actually know how we're how we're best spending our money, how things are going, and how, keeping everything working as well as we can with the money we have. So thank you very much. I, I know a lot of work has gone into this. I think Martha, you've been working on this for a while, and and Director Spencer. I mean, what is this? Four years? Five years? I know I've heard about it for many years, and uh, it feels like we're getting close. So yeah. I'm very excited to hear more about it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, on my end, uh, question, is there a legacy work order system that's going to be uh, discontinued after we get, get switched over here? There are multiple. Yep. Go? Multiple. So in, in water, we have two separate ones for we have keep track on the wastewater side. And we have manager plus pro both of which are pretty clunky. And as a result, probably not everything that should be in a work order system is in a work order system. So um, those will both be, the data will be brought over and then those will be um, abandoned. Gotcha, thanks. Yeah. Same, Same goes with the uh, facility dude, which is used by DPW and BPRW right now. Mm -hmm. Question on the um, like pipe failures, Megan, I know we've talked about like you, you, you have that history of pipe breakage where and when Presumably that data gets transferred over into this new system as well. Yeah, I mean that data lives already in our GIS with sort of our uh, workaround um, asset management system. This is going to make it that much easier for our field staff. Instead of having to click on a little tiny pipe, it's going to be much more accessible as far as the forms that they're filling out and being able to take pictures and so on and so forth. But all of that information would be ported over um, with our existing GIS. So is that part of this transition process that like somebody somehow on some date needs to be zapping data, zapping that data over into the new system? Well, that's part of their contract to the degree that we can export things in a way that it can be sucked into their system with unique identifiers. Um, we're obviously mm -hmm. going to try to automate as much of that, but I'm sure there's going to be a fair amount of either rebuilding things, you know, in the system, particularly if the system that it's coming from is not perfect, right? Um, but all of that is part and parcel. We're buying the software, we're also buying data migration, implementation planning, all of that. Got it, thank you for that. And is there, um, in the conversation of other systems that we're looking to integrate with this ViewWorks, one that was mentioned in the comment was the, the RTA fleet management. Could you clarify what is, what's needed or different out of a separate fleet management system than this uh, sort of general asset management tool that we're talking about? So fleet manage, the RTA is a very specific software program for fleet. And uh, each of our vehicles are in it. They, uh, they've been using it for over a decade and it does have a work order system in it and it tracks all the assets. It doesn't do a good job of helping us with the depreciation and understanding when we need to replace. So it would integrate in to help us understand the assets and do the capital planning on it. And uh, the work order system within it will 
pull out so that it can let us know when maybe a vehicle, even though it's not old enough, it's having too many repairs and we need to replace it versus another that might be older, but is not causing the repairs yet. Mm -hmm. And it will also help us on our, our labor end understanding uh, how much labor we need to take care of the vehicles, but it's very specific versus our CMMS. It, it does a lot more. We did want to replace it and it did not end up being worth while to do so. Okay. So if, if I've got you right, it sounds like there, there's enough vehicle specific management stuff to, to keep that around. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're leveraging uh, sort of the, the, the best parts of, of each of these tools here. Yes. All right. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you so much. This is, uh, this is exciting stuff. Thank you. With that, bring it to public comments. We have any uh, anyone from the public still around here? There's nobody still with us on the public side. Here, hold on. Rob, we're having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. There is nobody signed up. Uh, or with us from the public side right now. Gotcha, thank you. Okay. And it's sad that the public is not like beating down the doors to talk about asset management, but I guess so. They'll, they'll be thinking this later. All right, with that, um, Director Spencer, we are listed here as, as seeking a vote. Is there sort of um, optional thing or might you suggest some language yeah. in the case? Uh, I apologize. I think one of the things we need to do a better job is provide uh, sample uh, motion language. We've been a little inconsistent as, as of late. Uh, we are going to the city council and board of finance on, uh, on February 8th. Uh, so if your commission was so inclined, uh, uh, a resolution that stated to recommend the city council approve the execution of contracts with DTS, KCI, and ROC. Those are the three we talked about tonight to implement the city's cross-departmental asset management program. That would be welcome. And, and the uh, loan amendments to pay for it. And the state revolving fund loan amendments. Yes, thank you. I'll make that motion. Thank you for that motion, Commissioner Overby. I'll oh, second it. Seconded by Commissioner Barr. Thank you. Is there any discussion around that motion? All right. Uh, let's go to a vote then. Uh, Commissioner Archambault. Aye. Commissioner Barr. Aye. Commissioner Bowes. Aye. Commissioner Gilman. Aye. Vice Chair O'Neill. Aye. Commissioner Overby. Aye. I, for myself, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much for the, the presentation and all the work here. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for all your support. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right, moving forward. Item eight on our agenda is the approval of draft minutes from our December meeting. Were there any changes submitted prior to this that we might not be aware of? No. Commissioner Maybe. Overby had a, a suggested change. I have, I have a change that I propose. Would you like me to read it? Please. Sure. Okay. The, under the, um, the item when we were discussing the Shelburne Street roundabout project, I wanted to add a bullet that was in the, within the questions and comments included. And this is what I was going to include. Commissioner Overby expressed concern that the proposed 25 mile per hour approach speed to the roundabout was too fast for the safety of pedestrian crossings at the roundabout. She recommended the approach speed be 15 miles per hour. DPW staff stated that Burlington is prohibited by state law from setting city traffic speeds to less than 25 miles an hour. Commissioner Overby said she would ask her state reps what steps were necessary at the state level to enable Burlington to set a 15 mile per hour speed limit for the approach to a roundabout. That was what I would like to 
add to the minutes. If that's your memory of what I said at the time as well. I make a motion to approve the minutes with said edits from Commissioner Overby. Second. Motion by Commissioner Barr, seconded by Commissioner Bose. Thank you. Uh, is there any discussion around that motion? All right, let's go to a vote on it. Commissioner Archambault. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Barr. Aye. Commissioner Bose. Aye. Commissioner Gilman. Aye. Vice Chair O'Neill. Aye. Commissioner Overby. Aye. And I, for myself, the minutes with the proposed amendment have passed unanimously. Thank you. Item nine, director's report. All right, thank you. I'll be exceedingly quick. Uh, I really wanted to hit one main item, which was the waterfront rail and bike path coordination that was first in my director's report. Uh, after many years of, uh, of very long negotiations with many parties on the waterfront, we are very close to a uh, large step forward for a multi-million dollar investment in sustainable transportation on the waterfront this coming season. And to achieve all that, we've had to uh, bring to the council, we're hoping this coming Monday night, a series of legal agreements, easements, licenses, um, uh, amendments uh, to uh, other agreements to help us uh, get the property rights in place and the finance and maintenance agreements with these assets to have the bike path move to the west side of the tracks between King and College and to bring passenger rail to Burlington. Uh, this has been a Herculean effort and I just wanna thank staff who's on this call and many other departments. Um, if commission's interested, uh, it should be going to council on Monday night uh, and construction would start uh, this construction season with passenger rail service starting as early uh, as this, um, this uh, late, late this year. So very exciting, uh, just big step forward and happy to talk more to anybody who's interested. Great, thank you for that. Back to item 10, Commissioner Communications. Uh, let's see, Commissioner Overby, would you like to start? I don't have any specific communication for tonight. All right. Vice Chair O'Neill. Mine is just so tiny. It was from the holidays, um, walking downtown. Um, I got to say, I love the Winooski Avenue configuration, um, crossing to get to the UPS store and to um, City Market was really fantastic. And I even drove down there um, once to City Market. I feel like I haven't driven downtown in ages. Um, so, and I actually remember that I had my car, so I didn't leave it. But um, I, it, it is, it's really refreshing to, um, to be moving. I haven't ridden my bike down there yet, but to be moving, walking and driving on Winooski Ave. So great job to um, DPW staff on that. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Archambault. I have nothing this time around. Thank you. All right, thank you. Commissioner Barr. Thanks. Um, I, I just have a couple of quick items. Um, one, it was voiced at the recent Ward 1A uh, meeting that uh, there's some fast cars going down East Avenue again. So I, I shared that I would bring that up again. Um, and one of the requests was um, that, that was said to me on the side was, could we get that speed reader back uh, that, that shows how fast cars are going? Um, so that, that was one thing that I promised that I would bring up. I, I also want to just as usual, give kudos to snow removal and how fantastic it, it is and how they've been doing such a great job, especially now that they're decentralized. It seems like it's getting done faster, um, New North End and, and all sorts of different places. So kudos for that. And the last item, um, last month, I shared uh, the Old East End Winterlude, which was supposed to be a, a winter fest kind of thing, where we, using COVID restrictions, we're trying to invite people to get outside 
do some activities, uh, but in conference with uh, uh, Department of Parks and Rec and, and, and the state, quite frankly, we thought that that might attract too many people to have hot beverages. And I was all psyched to do sugar on snow and uh, I got everything ready and we will probably ease off on that. Um, so what, just to let everybody know who might be listening into this, um, we still will have activities, but it will be a do it yourself. There's gonna be a scavenger hunt. There's gonna be a nature walk. Um, we're dressing up the barn. We've got some lighting going around. Uh, so it's just gonna be a nice place. There's a great hill to slide on. Uh, so we're going to be doing as much as we can over the next couple of months to really improve it so people can get out and enjoy enjoy the great outdoors. So that was it for me. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bose. Uh, nothing really from me other than to, uh, to say that I'm very excited to see the, uh, the plans that um, Director Spencer just mentioned. Thanks. Indeed. Thank you. Commissioner Gilman. Uh, nothing, nothing for me. All right. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, 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 mine, I'm, I'm impressed with the, uh, the breadth of the agenda here. We heard from uh, most, take the notches on a lot of our departments or, or sub, uh, sub uh, divisions within the department tonight. It's good stuff. Um, I will just add, you know, on the, on the narrow streets thing, appreciate the update. Tonight, I think it would be worth on the on the communication side if we could sort of publish in a transparent way, uh, you know, where things stand with that. I had, you know, as this issue was sort of popping up um, in my neighborhood, that people mentioned in public comment this, this evening, I was looking back at, uh, you know, I guess it was fall of 2018 when we we had in our packet that. Uh, the table, the sort of the, the sorted list of all the sort of candidate streets for this program, and the table was uh, the formatting was a little a little rugged on it, and column not totally lined up with their headers and so forth. But I think if we had, I think there's opportunity to 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 clean that up and post that online. So sort of as these inquiries come up, we could say, like, yep, it's. You know, it's on your list. Generally, you know, the last time we checked, the parking occupancy was 26%. So it's not the top of the list, but there's a chance to improve there. And the, the other thing I would add, I think, um, I don't know if we do this, but maybe we can check with with Lee and his team, which is sort of making have uh, staff if they're not already doing this, make a note when they get back of the if there are streets where there is issues. Like, you know, I wasn't able to get the recycling on. Charlotte Street on January 4th said, so sort of make a note of when that stuff comes up. Because people sort of chime in and be like, oh yeah, my street didn't get plowed like twice last year or th this kind of thing that it'd be great. You know, certainly I guess we can crowdsource those reports on C Click Fix. But as uh, if we'd be collecting that stuff on the staff side, I think it would help uh, us all sort of build the case for changes the next time around or help us prioritize uh, issues that are creeping up. Uh, I, you know, as I'm saying this out loud, I'm thinking, oh yeah, you know, we have, we certainly have the C-Click fix stuff. We could search back, you know, when, it, when the time is right to be evaluating future streets. But, um, anyways, that is all I have for this evening. With that, I'll close out Commissioner Communications and go to item 11, adjournment and next meeting date, February 17. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second right. the motion. Seconded by Vice Chair O'Neill. Thank you for that. Uh, to a vote, all those in favor, say aye. 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 I let you aye. have that. Any aye. opposed? All right. Thank you all. We are adjourned at 9 11 p.m. See you on February 17th. Thanks, all. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks. Great. See you.